is the Bible sexist? Now, this video is pretty long, so if you're looking for a particular passage or verse uh, that you don't know how to explain or you think it proves that the Bible is sexist, you can look in the description. I've included the timestamps of every verse that we look at. Um, and there's a lot of them in this video, so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Is the Bible sexist? I've been hearing this claim recently, and someone sent me this video, and she said that it convinced her that the Bible was indeed sexist. Uh, so we're going to take a look at it today. We're going to see the claims that he makes and compare them to the biblical text and see how they how they hold up. Uh, now, I will say straight away that in this video, this guy gives his opinion a whole lot. He's, he makes a whole bunch of claims and does not provide scripture. So I'll just I'll say straight up, whenever he makes a claim and provides no biblical uh, basis for that claim, I'm just going to... I'm just going to assume he's wrong, okay? In fact, I'm going to count on the fact that he's wrong. But anytime he provides a biblical text, we're going to see how his claim matches the biblical text and see if they support each other. So let's get right into it. I have a Christian friend. I'll call my friend Kiri. Kiri and I are similar in a lot of ways. We went to the same high school. We were on the same sports team. We were in the same choir. We shared a carpool to school every day, and at one time, we were both very devoted Christians, the kinds of Christians that don't pick and choose from the Bible. Amen. A bit has changed since then, and Kiri has recently found out that I am no longer a Christian. Kiri asked me why I lost the faith, and I responded, firstly, because I can't believe in the story anymore. Alright, so, whenever I come across someone who claims that they used to be a Christian, ex-Christian, I ask them, so you know, or you, you knew the Lord Jesus Christ, you had a personal relationship with the God of this universe, and they'll tell me, oh, I thought I did, right? So what does the Bible tell us? Um, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Uh, God's Holy Spirit, when we're born again, we receive His Holy Spirit. And His Spirit will testify to our spirit that God is true, that we're known of God. So when someone claims that they used to be a Christian, but they've never had a born-again experience, they've never had, I mean, they don't have the Holy Spirit, they never knew Jesus personally, what does the Bible tell us? They weren't actually a Christian. But... Let's see, let's continue. It looks like a story that men made up. And it looks like men made it up partially to keep women subjugated. So men made up the Bible to to partially keep women subjugated. That's his first claim. Let's see how he supports it. If I were to stay committed to the words, ideas, and themes of the Bible, then I could no longer think of women as an equal, but as something lesser. And their only usefulness to me is their submission and their sexuality. The Bible is extremely sexist, and I don't agree with that kind of prejudice. Carrie seemed puzzled. Why do you think the Bible is sexist? Notice, Carrie didn't ask about the submission. Carrie knew about that part in the Bible and thought it was something to aspire to. Yeah, we'll talk about this in a second, the, the submission in the Bible. Anyway, Carrie asked, so I answered. Women in the Bible are reduced to the status of property and sex objects. Depending on your copy of the Bible, you'll see that in chapter 7, verse... Okay, so first claim, or second claim, third, fifth, fifth opinionated claim. Women are... Actually, this is the... I'll take that back. He provides a scripture for this one, so let's, let's see what the scripture says. But he, he claims that women are reduced to property and sex objects, okay? And he, he, he gives us Genesis 7, 2. Let's see his justification. Two of Genesis that female animals also belong to their male counterparts. Women in the Bible aren't complete until okay, counterpart. Okay, 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 okay. So this easily could have been said. You shall take with you uh, of every clean animal by sevens a female and her male. Okay. Don't we say things like that today? That's her husband. That's my wife. That's your husband. That's your wife. Um, let's let's go to my the first scripture I have for us here. First Corinthians seven three through four it says, "Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So when people get married, their body no longer belongs to them. They no longer have power over their own body." The husband's body belongs to the wife, and the wife's body belongs to the husband. So that's why we could say, oh, that's my wife. Or she could say, that's my husband, right? I don't I don't see how this is a justification here. It's not, I'll be honest with you, not starting off strong. Um, using a verse in Genesis talking about Noah's ark and the animals going to the ark. A male and his female. A man and his wife. A woman and, and, and her 
husband, you know? It's perfectly normal. Chapter 7, verse 2 of Genesis, that female animals also belong to their male counterparts. Women in the Bible aren't complete until God allows them to have children. All women in the book of Genesis... Men in the Bible, or excuse me, women in the Bible are not complete until God allows them to have children. Okay, let's see how he supports it. This have a similar storyline, give or take a few points. First, they meet their husband. Next, they become a wife and try very, very hard to have children. God blesses them for some random act of faith and gives them children. It's as if the only dream of a woman is to be a mother. Every woman in the Bible is there precisely because of her sexuality. Okay. Yeah, so... Well, I'll just I'll let him, I'll let him make this point. Quick. And it generally falls into one of three categories. One, having sex with other male characters. Whores, mothers, adulteresses, wives, concubines, etc. Two, being someone's wife. This is a case of a man owning a woman's sexuality. Three, being someone's mother. Evidence of sex in the past. Eve falls into all three categories, as does Moses' wife, Sarah, Sariah, Bathsheba, Rachel, Esther, Orpah, as, as well as any other woman in the Bible that has a name. Okay, so, first of all, he makes a claim that every other woman in the Bible that has a name falls under these categories. Uh, the Bible's a history book, right? So naturally, when you're recording the genealogies of people, they're going to be mothers, mm -hmm. they're going to be fathers, mm -hmm. there's going to be wives, there's going to be husbands. And then there's going to be sex between those wives and husbands. Yeah, that, that's what happens. That's how you make children. Um, so, so his argument here, I suppose, is that because women um, are recorded doing these things, being mothers, being wives, uh, and having sex with their husbands, that the Bible is sexist. I'm not really sure how this makes sense. Maybe somebody can make this make sense to me. I mean, we could flip this. I mean, what if I, if I take your logic and I flip it on, on, around on you? Oh, men are in the, in the Bible having sex with their wives. They're, they're, they're being husbands. They're being fathers. How, what's the word? Misandrist? Is that the opposite of uh, misogynist? Something like that. How, how, how the Bible is misandrist. It's, 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 uh, it hates men. You see what kind of logic this is? It's like, yes, women are mothers or wives, and they have sex with their husbands. And in a history book that records genealogies, for one, we're going to see this. Just because this is in the text does not mean that the Bible is sexist, so we'll, we'll continue here. As well as any other woman in the Bible that has a name. The exception of... Well, that's, yeah, that's not true. That Not every woman in the Bible is, is a, a mother or a wife. Um, yeah, and not all of them are have sex, so, well, which is what he's about to say. As well as here. any other woman in the Bible that has a name. The exception, of course, is Mary, the Holy Blessed Virgin Mother Mary. She's also known by her sexuality, but her divine circumstances are on the other end. Yeah, indeed. So in Isaiah 7.14, um, I didn't intend to, to go to this verse, but we'll just look at it real quick. Isaiah 7.14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, but yeah, so the prophet prophesied a, a, a sign that a virgin would conceive, and this has never happened before. Yeah, so no, no question, you know, I mean, the whole point of the Old Testament is to point to Jesus Christ in the New Testament, that someone was going to come to die for our sins, and that person was Jesus. So a sign that would, would be given is that a virgin would conceive. So there's no, there's no question why Mary is called the Virgin Mary, is because she's the one who fulfilled this sign. Okay, it's not because she's property. It's not because we look at women as uh, uh, through the lens of sexuality. It's simply because this prophecy was made that the entrance of the Messiah into the world would be through the miraculous sign of a virgin. And since Mary was that virgin that that our our Lord uh, was born to, she's henceforth called the Virgin Mary. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with objectifying women. Where's okay? Here we go. Of the spectrum. It is because of her sexuality that she has been chosen to be a mother. She's still serving her purpose as a sexual vessel and incubator of men. She's just God's sexual vessel. Yeah, she's serving her purpose as an incubator of men and a sexual vessel. Show me in the text. Thus far, um, he has not shown me in the text. So I'm just going to... I won't say that. I won't, I won't get him like that. We'll just continue. Vessel in this case. It's interesting that the Bible tries to make their deity holy by saying that his mother wasn't tainted by the sinfulness of sex. Okay, sex is not sinful. 
the text is not sinful, God commanded Adam and Eve to multiply. Therefore, since God is holy and just and good, he cannot command somebody to sin. Therefore, sex is not sinful, contrary to some, some teachings. I'm not going to go in, into those, um, those doctrines that some people teach. But, but that's a lengthy topic for another day. Uh, also, the Bible also makes mention of Jesus' brothers and sisters. So unless God fathered all these children, Mary wasn't a virgin for long. Amen. Mary was not a perpetual virgin, contrary to what some people teach. Mary did indeed have brothers and sisters. Even um, even if if their interpretation were true, like, well, I don't want to go into all this right now. Uh, but the duty of a wife and the duty of a husband were to to have sex with each other. Um, that's that's what the Bible calls the right the, the duties of marriage. So if a, if a husband were to withhold sex from his wife, that would be wrong. Same thing with if, if a wife withheld sex from her husband, that would be wrong. So, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph were married. Um, they were supposed to act a certain way. They were supposed to fulfill their marriage duties. Therefore, yeah, um, she was not a virgin for long. I concur with you on that one. There wasn't tainted by the sinfulness of sex. But that's a lengthy topic for another day. A quick walk through Genesis will make my points for me. Starting with the first woman, we see that women's purpose is only to ruin the lives of men everywhere and become their sexual property. Show me the Bible, please, that the woman's purpose was to ru uh, ruin men's lives and become sexual property. Show me, please. The creation story is ridiculous, but it shows the Jews' earliest attempt to establish dominance of the men over the women. The creation story is ridiculous, huh? That's another story, buddy. Ridiculous, but it shows the Jews' earliest attempt to establish dominance of the men over the women. So the creation story, the, the intention of it was to establish the dominance of men over women. Okay. Well, the truth is the creation story was to show that we lived, or, or Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world with no sin, with no death, with no suffering. They, had, they didn't have to work. They had everything made for them. Um, and then they sinned. Sin came into the world. Now we die. People go to hell. And we need a savior to be saved from our sins and, and from eternal damnation. That's the point of the creation story is to show the fall of man and that we need a savior. Not, not objectifying women, not uh, establishing them as inferior or as property. After Eve tempts Adam with the fruit, both of them are cursed. And how... Okay, well, when you hold all women accountable for sin they didn't commit, you're being sexist. We don't hold women accountable for the sin Eve committed. You can't hold somebody accountable for something they did not do. I'm not, I'm not sure who does that. How much of a jump is it from tempting Adam with a fruit to tempting Adam with her fruit? Okay, so <laughs> I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. Eve tempted Adam with her fruits. They were, they were married. Uh, how exactly would you do that? I don't know. They were, they were commanded by God to have sex and to multiply. So I'm not sure what's what he's talking about there. But um, Eve he, said, he, said, he said something else. Both of them are cursed. And how men over the women. After Eve tempts Adam with the fruit, both of them are cursed. And how much of a jump is it from tempting Adam with a fruit to tempting Adam with her fruit. Eve is cursed with pain in childbirth, is commanded to breed, and to be submissive to her husband by God. Adam is told that he needs to work if he wants to eat. Every single one of Eve's curses is tied into being Adam's sexual property, while Adam's curse is common sense fact. You do have to work if you want to eat. Yeah, actually, so in the Garden of Eden, you know, we didn't have to, let me just show you the scripture here, Genesis 3. So, uh, unto Adam he said, because you, you hearken or you listen to the voice of your wife, you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded uh, thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So, you know, back in, in the Garden of Eden, we didn't have to sweat to get our food. We didn't have to do all this hard work and then, and then lose, uh, lose a whole bunch of our energy and our time to not even receive the full, uh, <laughs> the full portion of it. Um, thorns and thistles also in uh, thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou was taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Yeah, so man was cursed. Man was cursed um, to do work that was not it did not have to previously previously be done. I mean, the Garden of Eden was a paradise. It didn't we didn't have to do this. But in terms of the woman's curse, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. 
in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, so in this video, in the video, the dude said, uh, let's just go back real quick. Eatland by God. Adam is told that he been in childbirth, to tempting Adam with her fruit. Eve is cursed with pain in childbirth, mm -hmm. is commanded to breed, and to... Okay, she's not commanded to breed. She, they Both of them were commanded to breed previously. God told them to be fruitful and multiply. Um, let's see. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 1, 28. So God blessed them, said be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. So that was commanded before. So he's trying to slip this in, saying that he's trying to imply that Eve is commanded to breed with, with man and be a sexual property and he can just have sex with you whenever he wants and so on and so forth. It's not in the text. It's not in the text. It says, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, let's see what he has to say about this. Be submissive to her husband by God. Mm -hmm. Adam is... Yeah, correct. So she, her curse is to be submissive to the husband. Now think about this. She ate the fruit without consulting her husband. Right, Adam knew. Uh, the I mean, Adam saw God make the animals. Adam named all the animals. Adam knew the commandments of God firsthand. Okay, Eve. She didn't know that firsthand. All she knew was what Adam told her afterwards, because she wasn't made until after all that happened. So when when Satan came to Eve with the fruit and tempted her, what should she have done? She should have went to the one who knew, you know, what to do. Uh, Adam, th this this strange snake is telling me to eat this fruit that I don't think I should eat. What should I do? You know, she should ask counsel, got advice from her husband. And since she didn't, she acted on her own volition. She she acted on her own desire and did what she wanted to do instead of consulting, you know, good counsel. This is her curse. And so she, she didn't listen to counsel or she didn't consult counsel when she should have. Now her curse is to be subject to that counsel. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You know, and this is something else to also consider. He shall rule over thee. So this was not this was not before the fall. This was not before. Um, this was not before Adam and Eve fell and they sinned, or they sinned and they fell. This was a command or a curse given after. So th there was a different dynamic in the garden than today. Yes, now a woman is is cursed to to have their husband rule over them okay that was not how god made it originally and that's not how it's going to be when god restores everything all right and i mean this is this is a whole nother point in its own but ask counsel okay the, the bible talks quite a bit about asking for advice and counsel from counsel from wise counselors eve did not ask counsel when she should have and now her curse is to um she doesn't have a choice to ask counsel now she has to um, I mean, counsel is is imposed on her. I suppose, I suppose you should say the husband rules over her. But yeah, we'll continue. Told that he needs to work if he wants sexual property. Well, Adam's curse is come eat. Every single one of Eve's curses is tied into being Adam's sexual property. Well, Adam's curse. Yeah, that's we just established that's not true. Curse is common sense fact. You do have to work if you want to eat. It should also be noted that the only time God ever talks to Eve's face is when he is cursing her. Yeah, I mean, it's probably safe to assume that God talked to Eve in the garden. There's no telling how long they were in the garden. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the only time in the scripture that we see God directly talking to Eve that's recorded is when he did curse her. But, yeah, it's probably safe to assume, considering how long they were there, um, that she probably did talk to him. If you want to eat. It should also be noted that the only time God ever talks to Eve it's very likely a high, high, high probability. Eve's face is when he is cursing her. How easy is it to keep your women subjugated when the religion of the day says that they have to be, and the punishment for leaving that religion is death or exile? Looking at you. Yeah, okay, buddy. Um, let's just listen to what he said one more time. Eve's face is when he is cursing her. How easy is it to keep your women subjugated when the religion of the day says that they have to be, and the punishment... Okay. How easy is it to keep your women subjugated when the religion of the day says they have to be? Okay. Um, well, the only... I mean, I suppose he's referring to the verse we just looked at, Genesis 3, 16, un unto the desire... Let's look at it real quick. Um, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. 
Um, yeah, I suppose he's, he's referring to that. But so he, he quotes this verse that talks about following other gods, right? If somebody if somebody goes off and, and rejects God, who, who they knew was the true God, because when this command was given in Deuteronomy, they were taken out of Egypt. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. God fed the man in the wilderness. Um, oh, it's their ancestor. So this is the younger generation. But they, 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 they heard all these stories of the, of the fathers. They saw uh, God's wondrous works. They knew that God was who he said he was, the creator of the universe. Um, so to to go and, and worship other gods is, is spitting in his face. It's blatant. Uh, it, it's it's sinning with a high hand. Um, and yeah, they were put to death. And there, there's a whole lot of things that can be said about this. But God was, I mean, he's a holy God. And when he chooses a holy people, if they if they forsake him and they try to lead other people to, to sin as well, the, pun, the punishment was death uh, for them. Uh, but yeah, he, he quotes he quotes this, this text about killing people who go off go off and worship other gods to try to use this to support women being sexual property or like having to be forced to be um, submissive. Gated when the religion of the day says that they have to be and the not submissive. How uh, easy is it to keep your women subjugated? Subjugate is a word to use. Yeah. When the religion of the day says that they have to be, and the punishment for leaving that religion is death or exile. Yeah, so yeah, the punishment for leaving, for, for worshiping other gods is death, right? The punishment for, for not obeying your husband is not death, okay? Don't, don't let them slip that in there. Don't let them try to slip that in there and fool you there. Looking at you, Islam. Then we... Yeah, is, yeah that's another story. <laughs> ...get to chapter 6 of Genesis, where we get to angel rape. The sons of God take all the women they choose, and the women give birth to the Nephilim? I'm not sure how you say that. Nephilim. Nephilim. It's odd, because the sons of God are contrasted against the daughters of men. Which implies that we're either talking about angel rape, or that women are so lowly that they are from a much lower source than God. Yeah, so there's debate about this. There, there's elsewhere in the scripture that calls the son of God angels. Um, in Job, for example. Um... Uh, I think it's, it's relatively assumed that angels or fallen angels did come down and they did uh, things that they were not supposed to do. This is not saying that men were called the sons of God and that women were just simply called the daughters of men. That's not what this is saying. The interpretation of this often is debated, but the message is when women breed the wrong way, it brings about death by flood. <laughs> okay. When women breed the wrong, the wrong way, it brings about death by flood. Yeah, so... so I mean, this is the very nature of sin. Sin is unnatural, right? And when people do unnatural things, uh, destruction happens, right? Now, the reason for the flood was not because women breeded the wrong, the breeded the wrong way. Okay, I'll show you what the, the reason of the flood was. Let me do this. So Genesis chapter six: God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every imagination, they're all wicked. They're only all thinking wickedness. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So why did God destroy the earth with a flood? It wasn't because women were breeding incorrectly, which of course, I mean, I... I don't know all the details. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of details of that, so I'm not going to go into that. But it's because the, the imagination and the thoughts of, of man's heart was evil continually. They were wicked. Yeah. So America, take uh, take note, America. God can, uh, God, God will destroy a nation if they become too utterly depraved and wicked. So, yeah, I need to be a little bit careful. We shall proceed. Women breed the wrong way, it brings about death by flood. Around chapters 6 to 10, we get to Mrs. Noah. Despite being one of presumably eight people on earth, she isn't named in the Bible. She only serves to be a mother. Her daughters in law give birth to nations, and they aren't named either. Then we get to Sarah Sariah, one of the most wicked people in the Bible. She embodies a stereotypical biblical woman. Her oh. beauty is a danger to Abraham when he is in Egypt. After being whored out to Pharaoh, and after she's unable to bear a child. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So, being whored out to Pharaoh, he claims. 
Uh, he says in verse 12, 16, and 20. Here we go. Uh, he entreated Abraham well. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of context here. So Abraham, or Abram at this time, went down into Egypt, and his wife was very beautiful. And he told, he told his wife, Sarai, that, oh, if they see you, they're going to they're gonna kill me so they can marry you. So then he tells her, tell everybody you're my sister. So he, he went into Egypt. They, they saw how beautiful she was. And then the Pharaoh took her. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. You know, he thought that she was his brother. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses. These are donkeys. And men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is thy, uh, my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. So I might have taken her to me to wife. You know, for, for how wicked some people were in, in, in the past, uh, adultery has always been at the at the forefront of things most people would not do. So he, even the Pharaoh of Egypt, he did not have sex with her. I and mean, this is what they're saying. So I might have taken her to me to wife. Okay. She was not his wife. He did not have sex with her. Uh, and then he sends her away. Okay. Now, therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Go thy way. She's jealous of another woman constantly out to Pharaoh and after she's unable to bear a child, she's jealous of another woman constantly nagging Abraham to do something about a situation that she caused. And the biggest problem in her <laughs> life is that she wants to have... Okay, yeah, so that is true. Um, she gave she gave her, her handmaid to Abram because she could not bear a child. And um, let me just show you this verse. This is kind of, this is kind of humorous. So Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. You will take the blame for what I've done. It's my fault that I gave you Hagar to wife. It's my fault that she, she has a child now. And it's my fault that, that she is mocking me because I can't bear a child. But this is all your fault. <laughs> uh, anyways, anyways. The baby, but she can't. Sarah's sexuality is her crucial characteristic. She's over 80 years old. Yeah, so her crucial characteristic is that she can't have a child. What do people do when they can't have children? You know, people get married and they very much want to have children. They realize something's wrong. Okay, they go to the doctors. They, they look up on, on Google Doctor. What do I do to have a child? To do whatever it possibly can take to have a child. Because when you want to have a child and you can't have a child, it's a problem. So just because, you know, in the Bible, the same thing that happens today, by the way, people can have children today and it's distressing to them. So back in the day, someone couldn't have a child. So this is sexist. And, and notice, notice what he adds here. He says, because that's all she's good for. Is this is this your belief? I mean, is this how you see women subconsciously? Um, because you haven't shown us in the biblical text that that this is the purpose of women, that they're property. Um, yeah, she, she can't have a woman and she's distressed. Uh, excuse me, she can't have a child and she's distressed. Yeah, this is I mean, this is normal, it doesn't make it sexist. And still a hottie when Alamech <laughs> hottie. takes her as his wife. She substitutes her sexuality for Hagar's because hers wasn't working. Never mind that Sarah is forcing Hagar to be raped over and over until she finally gets pregnant. Yeah, I don't know where exactly where he gets this. He needs to, he doesn't understand the context of these type of relationships. So um a husband and a wife, right? Abram was extremely rich. He had a whole lot of material possessions. And since he did not have a child, when Abram died, his inheritance, since he did not have a son uh, or, or any sort of any child at all, even a daughter, his inheritance would have went to the head, uh, the head of his servants. So the servant that was the highest rank wasn't related to him in any way. It's just his servant. He would have got all his inheritance. So it's a very big deal to not only keep the family name going, this is a very big cultural thing to keep the family name going, but also to, you know, maintain your inheritance. Abram was very rich and to not give it to some, I don't want to say a random guy, but some guy who's not necessarily linked to Abram. He's just a servant. Um, <clears throat> so this is why there's this, there's so much, um, 
desire to have a child here. I mean, it's just completely culturally intertwined too. And like, if you read in the scriptures elsewhere, um, there, there's laws even that if somebody dies, or if if um, husband and wife are married and the husband dies, to keep the the, the name going and the inheritance, um, the brother is supposed to marry that wife and, and then have a child and keep that the, the family name going and the inheritance going. So in in this this culture, children were very uh, they were valued highly, obviously as they still well they still are today valued highly. Court. <laughs> A lot of people kill babies and they think it's okay. It's another story, but yeah. So uh, she wanted to have a child. Okay, it's not sexist. Finally, Sarah Saraya conceives a son, Hagar, to be raped. Over oh yeah. And over. Also, I mentioned this. Um, she was not forcing her to be raped, as we'll see later in the text, uh, in in a passage that, that he provides. Rape is punishable by death. Yeah, rape is punishable by death. Uh, they, she she had to willingly. Uh, accept this this proposal i mean yeah she um sarai uh, gave hagar to be abram's wife but she's it's not like she, if she doesn't want to do it you know they, they force her to do it that's not how this works rape is is a capital offense um i mean again he, he makes his claim without any understanding at all of, of the context of history or their culture uh, especially no biblical biblical um Justification until she finally gets pregnant. Finally, Sarah Sariah conceives a son for Abraham because Amen. she was so faithful. Isn't Amen. God great? It's well, the reason why she had a son was not necessarily her faithfulness, it's because God made a promise to Abraham, to Abram, and God does not break his promises. It seems that being faithful to God and being moral aren't the same thing. And the, yeah, and being okay. The Abrahamic story points that out time and time again. Yeah, so being faithful to God and being moral are not the same thing. And he's going to make this point again, which I'll, I'll elaborate on that um, when he makes the point again. But um, obviously he has not proven his claim. Uh, I, I, he he says that it's immoral because Hagar is f forced to be raped. But yeah, I mean, it's not the case. So not the case. Don't let, him, don't let him slip that one in on you. Immoral. There's a side plot about Lot. story points that out time and time again. There's a side plot about Lot, who is so respected and revered for protecting God's angels by giving up his daughters to be raped by a mob. Yeah, and I will tell you, this was sinful. This was this was a horribly bad thing to do. Okay, no one's going to justify this. This is the one man who Yahweh doesn't kill in the destruction of an entire city because he's so faithful. Yeah, so the reason... Um... Well, he is Abraham's uh, Abram's nephew, I believe is his nephew, yeah. Uh, so God spares him, obviously. And let's just see the point he has to make. But obviously, morality isn't a factor to being faithful. Lot. Yeah, yeah, so Lot committed something that was atrocious. He offered his, his daughters to be raped instead of the two angels that came to save Lot. That's not justifiable. That's sinful, right? But this guy, the author of this video says, how could God save such such a person who would do this? Okay, the reality is we're all sinners. How could God save any of us who, who've done? Let's just take a look at the Ten Commandments. All right, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commandments. Where are the Where are the jokers at? Jo Exodus 20. Here we go. Not jokers. I take that back. I'm sorry. Where are these? Yeah, blessed commandments. Here we go. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, punishable by death. Have you ever had an idol? Have you ever? Uh, well, if you're an atheist, you have idols, uh, and those are punishable by death anything you hold to a higher standard high reverence than god okay uh, no graven images you should not take the name of the lord thy god in vain you ever done that punishable by death ever profane the sabbath day uh, -oh. uh which by the way for in six days the lord made heaven and earth yeah that's another topic anyways ever ever disrespected your parents um ever killed the bible says if you if you hate your brother you're a murderer Ever committed adultery? Jesus says if you look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Ever stolen something? Ever told a lie? Ever coveted something? Ever was jealous or wanted uh, something that your your neighbor or your friend or somebody that had somebody um, somebody else had that you did not have? Oh man, I'm pretty sure I broke all ten of these. I don't know. I'll let you speak for yourself, but how could anybody in the Bible be called just or faithful? When they've broken all these and more, like I said, there's hundreds more commandments. Hmm. Let me let me see what his claim was here. Let's see what his claim was. Why? Because he's so faithful. 
But obviously, morality isn't a factor to being faithful. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, morality, morality is linked to faithfulness, but you're, you're, I mean, he's just making, and he's, he doesn't understand the claim he's making. Nobody's perfect, right? So following his logic, God cannot do anything good to anybody because we've all done atrocious, horrible acts of sin, right? And I'm not justifying what Lot did. It's, 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 it's terrible what Lot did, right? But because he makes, he makes a, a mistake, he, he sins, he does wrong one time. I mean, really, the, the just punishment is to go to hell for eternity, right? That's why Christ came to redeem us from that. But God's mercy is that he, he saves us anyway. So, yeah, Lot, Lot made a mistake offering his daughters to be raped by the mob. That's a big mistake. Um, but God, um, <laughs> he shows mercy. Even, even though we make mistakes, he, he shows mercy to those who seek his mercy. So. Lot's wife, however, is killed for, Let me change this. for looking backwards. Full. Lot's wife, however, is killed for looking backwards. It seems that Yahweh doesn't care about the plight of women at all and smiles at their debasement in order to preserve his male servants. Dude, come on, man. You can't... You, are you serious? Let me just listen to it one more time. Lot's wife, however, is killed for looking backwards. Mm -hmm. Yep, Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt because she looked backwards. Now, let's see. What reason does he give for this? It seems that Yahweh doesn't care about the plight of women at all. And Yahweh doesn't care about the plight of women. Smiles at their debasement in order to preserve his male servants. And smiles at their debasement in order to preserve his male servants. Okay, so the reason that, that she was turned into a pillar of salt for looking behind her, because God doesn't care about women. Let's see what the Bible has to say about why she was turned into a pillar of salt. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry. Here we Yeah, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, this is Lot and his, and his wife and his two daughters, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all thy plain, all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So what, is, what, are, they, what are these angels saying? Don't look behind you or you're going to be consumed. Escape for your life to the mountain or you're going to be consumed. And then what did Lot's wife do? She did not listen to them. She looked behind her and she was consumed. Oh, so she wasn't she wasn't killed because Yahweh hates women. She was killed because the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that even looking at it would just would kill you. Um, she was killed because she disobeyed and she looked back when they told her not to look back. So it's not that God hates women. It's because she did not do what she was told to do. And see... I mean, this is just a sad reality. Like, I read the comments of the video, and people were saying, "Oh, this video is so accurate." And I mean, I'll just, I'll, I'll address you all plainly. You don't understand the Bible. Like, you, you can't say the video is 100% accurate when, the, when the video author is making claims like this. Oh, Yahweh turned her into a pillar of salt because he hates women. Are you, are you serious? If you just read the text, it'll tell you exactly why, why she was turned into a pillar of salt. Because the destruction was great. She was consumed because she should not have looked back. That's what the Bible says. I have to play this back one more time. Like This is a, a ridiculous claim. Yahweh doesn't care about the plight of women at all and smiles at their debasement in order to preserve his male servants. Yeah, this is, Peter, this is ridiculous, dude. It's ridiculous. Even call and, and then, I mean, we're going to see more claims. I don't, I don't know how long this recording is. 38 minutes thus far. Um, he's going to make many, many more crazy claims. And honestly, it's very sad, okay? Take, take this as a lesson to never take what anybody says uh, by itself. Always research what people say, never just accept what somebody says, ever. Especially when it comes to something like the Bible, right? If the Bible is God's word, if it is if it is inspired by the, the creator of the universe, you should not take some random atheist word for what the Bible says who doesn't understand the Bible um, over you know your own due diligence research, right? Because if the Bible is true, what does the Bible say? Anybody who's a sinner is gonna go to hell unless they're forgiven. And if somebody, if somebody makes a video on YouTube that you don't understand, or you don't, you don't, you don't know the Bible yourself, you watch someone who talks about the Bible that they don't understand the Bible themselves, and you're like, oh wow, you know these verses out of context, these verses um, with with no proper interpretation placed upon them, these really seem like God hates women in the Bible sexes. You know, I'm not going to trust the Bible, and this dude is turning you away from eternal life because he doesn't know what he's talking about. So. Don't, don't take my word for granted. Don't take anybody's word for granted. If somebody makes a claim, especially about extremely important topics, research it yourself. Okay, that's a, 
that's a general rule of thumb i think will, will get you a long way in life just don't take people's word for granted what, what's the what's the, how's the saying go trust but verify something like that yeah we'll continue here it's a lot just and righteous yeah if you ask me the only just or righteous act he could have committed when the rape mob was at his door would be to defend everyone inside his household with his life mm -hmm. but who am i to question god's perfect yeah i i agree with you again what he did was sinful but are we going to take what one man did um and condemn him for the rest of his life for it have you ever sought forgiveness? Have, have you ever done anything wrong? Imagine if you, you, you sinned against somebody, you did wrong against somebody, and they held that over your head your entire life, right? Just because you tell, uh, you know, you, you stole one thing, you told one lie, right? And then for the rest of your life, they call you that. You know, you ask for forgiveness, so on and so forth. Even though what you know, even though what you did, you know is wrong, right? So how can the Bible say something like this? Talking about David, the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. David had committed murder, he committed adultery, but yet the Lord has sought him, him a man after his own heart, okay? And it, the reality is, if we were held to the standard of perfection, if we made one mistake, if we, if we sinned one time, if we, if, we, if we offered our daughters to a rape mob, right, this is a horrible, horrible crime, um, and God just judged us, judged us off the one time we made a mistake, we're all dead, we're all going to hell. David committed adultery, uh, David committed murder, but God calls him a man after God's own heart. So how does how does that work? According to your logic, or would be to defend everyone in According to your logic, Lot isn't righteous because he made one mistake. Inside his household with his life. But but David again killed uh, killed Bathsheba's husband, committed adultery with her. But God uh, calls her a man after his own heart. Um, let me show you here. Um, yeah, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. So so what does this tell us? Nobody's perfect. Even a murderer and adulterer can be considered a man after God's own heart. Why? Why? It's because God looks at our heart. He wants us to seek forgiveness and he wants us to repent. He wants us to acknowledge that we've done wrong. He doesn't want us to just be arrogant and say, oh, I haven't done any sin. Oh, even worse. Oh, God doesn't even exist at all. So I could do whatever I want. Right? David committed horrible crimes and he repented to the Lord. He said, Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Um, he had a contrite heart. The Lord forgave him. David followed what the Lord commanded him to do. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart, is to be obedient, okay? None of us are perfect. None of us are going to live a perfect life. Uh, we're going we're gonna to sin. We're going to make terrible, terrible mistakes. But as long as we repent, we, we, we well, first you have to be forgiven through Christ. It's Christ. That, that's, that's the baseline. If you're not forgiven through Jesus Christ, your sins are not covered, and um, God won't even hear your prayers, okay? So um, he'll ignore them, according to the scripture. So you have to be covered by the blood of Christ. Um, and then you have to be willing to repent when the Lord shows you that you're wrong and um, do what God says. That's what, that's what it means. That's how someone like Lot could be considered righteous. He could have a momentary, uh, a big momentary oopsie, a, a big sin, but he could still be considered righteous because he could repent of that. He could realize what he did was wrong, ask the Lord for forgiveness, and then try to make it right as best as he can do. That's what it means to be righteous. Righteous does not mean perfect. If righteous meant perfect according to your logic, you would be in trouble yourself. But who am I to question God's perfect judgment? Offering your daughters to be raped? Perfect. Looking backwards? Damnable. Then we get to Rebecca, who is introduced like this. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. That's right, the sentence immediately after Rebecca's introduction categorizes her sexuality. She's beautiful, a virgin, and no man has had relations with her. She's worth. Yeah, you gotta understand, in this culture, um, as we'll see in this video, this guy, uh, he, he seems to have no problem with... with uh, whores with fornication so on and so forth but in this culture a woman who was pure uh, and just and did not go sleep around with other people was a respected woman indeed um, and and that's who was fit to be the wife of um, Jacob Abraham no Abraham Isaac yeah Isaac's wife um, yeah worthy of being in the Bible because her sexuality is intact She's the next sexual incubator for a Jewish man to grow inside. Yeah, there, there goes another comment, sexual incubator. Um, 
She's the next sexual incubator for a Jewish man to grow inside. So, she's sorry. she's worthy of being in the Bible because her sexuality is intact. She's the next sexual incubator. Yeah, I mean, okay. She's the next sexual incubator for a Jewish man to grow inside. We have the story of Jacob. Jake. Yeah. Um. Again, like I said, this guy's gonna start making comments about how it's okay to be a whore, how it's okay to sleep with as many people as you want, uh, and the Bible condemns that. The Bible. Uh, adulterers are put to death. Fornication is uh, it's, it's a sin. It's uh, it's a very big cultural uh, shun. It's a very big cultural shun if you're known to be a prostitute. Um, so again, it, it's it's a virtue. It's it's a very respectable thing for for someone. I mean, we're talking about Abraham's son, Isaac, right? Uh, how how fitting that he would have a virtuous woman, indeed. She's the indeed. the next sexual the story of Jacob. Jacob marries the wrong sister and has sex with her before realizing that he married the wrong person. I'm not even sure how you begin to do that. Yeah, okay, so I'll explain this to you. Um, I'll just, I'll read you this commentary from John Gill. So yeah, um, Jacob was promised Rachel. He, he worked seven years for Rachel to take her as a wife. And it came to pass on uh, the wedding night that he received a wife, he had sex with her, and woke up in the morning and realized that it was not Rachel. And a lot this brings a lot of trouble to people saying, how could this be possible? How could you not know who you're sleeping with, right? And it, it, it's, I mean, it's culture, it's, it's their custom here. Let's see, let's see what John Gill says about this. He took Leah's daughter and brought her to him. Um, yeah, he, so he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, to Jacob, in his apartment, his bedchamber, or to him in bed. For it is still the custom in some eastern countries for the bridegroom to go to bed first, and then the bride comes or is brought to him in the dark and veiled so that he sees her not. So the Arminians have uh, now such a custom at their marriages that the husband goes to bed first, nor does the bride put off her veil till in bed. And in Barbary, the bride is brought to the bridegroom's house and with some of her female relations conveyed into a private room. Then the bride's mother or some very near relation introduces the bridegroom to his new spouse who is in the dark and obliged in modesty not to speak or answer upon any account. And if this was the case here, as it is highly probable as it was, or highly probable it was, the imposition on Jacob is easily accounted for. Yeah, so I mean, you just have to study the cultural context around these biblical times and um, it, your answer is, your question is answered. Anyways, he marries both sisters, Leah and Rachel. Jacob isn't content with that, so he decides to bed Zilpah and Bilhah there. Yeah, so he, he's wrong here again. Jacob is not content with his two wives, so he decides to, to wed these other two wives. The reason in the Bible why he, he took these two wives is because Leah and Rachel stopped having children. So Leah and Rachel gave their handmaids to um, Jacob to have more children. And, I mean, this is really not a good idea. The whole point is to have one wife. God sanctioned marriage between one man and one wife, which we'll look at in a little bit. But they had a little bit of a competition going on. They were jealous of each other, so they wanted to see who could have more children. And then when they stopped having children, they gave their their handmaids so they could have more children through her. And in their culture, if if a if a servant, if a if a maid servant was given to a man by a woman, the child of that maid servant would be considered that woman's. So if Rachel gave, um, I don't remember which one Rachel gave, Bilha or Zilpah, whichever one Rachel gave, if Bilha, if Rachel gave Bilha and Bilha had a son, that would be culturally, that would be Rachel's son. Um, that's how it worked. So it's not as he says here. Slaves. He marries both sisters, Leah and Rachel. Jacob isn't content with that, so he does. He isn't content with that. Yeah, if you would read the biblical text, you would see that that's not the Sides reason. to bed Zilpah and Bilha, their slaves. Jacob has one daughter, and in the story, she is raped. Mm -hmm. The rape becomes a source of sh shame for the family. The daughter disappears from the Bible, having no further value as a pure vessel to be owned by a respectable man. Yeah, so of course, again, he's, <laughs> he's I don't understand how he's coming up with these things. Um, so, Dina was the daughter, and she was, she was raped indeed, and they, they pillaged and destroyed that entire... Um, kingdom city i don't know how big it was um castle everybody that lived in there was killed 
Um, <laughs> uh, I think maybe they took maybe they took the the children um, alive. It's been a minute since I read that story, but basically, Dina was was raped and they they enacted vengeance, which was I, obviously we're not supposed to retaliate and kill everybody. But um, yeah, but then he he gives us this guy. The author gives a spin on this. Appears from the Bible in the story. She appears from the Bible, having no further value as a pure vessel to be owned by a respectable man. Yeah, no further value. So he still hasn't established that women are owned by men and that they're only vessels for for having children. So this is another opinion piece that I'll I'll uh, add to my collection of opinion pieces. <laughs> I'm ignoring all the nameless concubines that are being taken through warfare, bloodshed, and trade. Sanctioned trade, by the way. Sanctioned by God. Uh, women are physically taken and made into slaves or forced into motherhood. Yeah, so nobody's ever raped. Nobody's ever forced into motherhood. Um, the, so the, the servant, I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't like to use the word slave. Uh, the proper term is servant. Because, well, for, for one, the, the Hebrew word is servant. But uh, slave brings up ideas of um, American slavery in which people were were stolen from their land and sold. But the Bible actually has protections against that. Um, where is that at? Uh, we'll, we'll get to it. I have the verse uh, somewhere in my, my collection here that I'm going through. But we'll see that if, if somebody steals a man, if somebody steals somebody and sells them, they're put to death for that. It, servants can even flee from their wicked masters, uh, and they're not to be returned. Um uh, that's a far, far fetch from American slavery, right? Where you just steal people, you sell them, and then they're your, your property. That's not how biblical servanthood works. So when um, he's talking about physically taken, made into slaves, and are forced into motherhood, the only the only difference would be if if someone was conquered in a war, instead of being killed, they would be turned into servants. And of course, to be a servant to a a country that actually has laws to protect them, instead of being killed, um, that's a win. You know that's a win, and of course, they're not. He's going to make this point again, but they're not forced to become. They're not forced to be married. They're not forced to be. They're not forced raped into motherhood, so on and so forth. That's just not how it works. Um, and he can't. He can't demonstrate that through through culture, through history, or through the Bible. So he, when he makes that claim, yeah, it's not. It's not valid. In all of these circumstances, the women have no say in who will be raping them and forcing them to become mothers. Yeah. Okay. Well can't support that the only prostitute to be named is tamar who is sentenced to burn okay she's not even a prostitute we're, we're really he's making a lot of mistakes here now burn for prostitution by the man who slept with her until he realized that she was the prostitute he slept with twice in the she wasn't even a prostitute either wait did i say that already hold on burn first the only prostitute yeah i think i just i think i just repeat that sorry it's five in the morning we're, we're getting this video we're getting this video done. You know to be saying? named as Tamar, who is yeah, she's not a prostitute. sentenced to burn for prostitution by the man who slept with her until he realized that she was the prostitute he slept with. Twice in the Bible, men will have sex with women that they know, but they don't even realize it. That's right. Women are so objectified that men won't even bother to look at the face of... Yeah, so let me show you how this happened here. Again, let me mention that she was not a prostitute. Um, I probably sh oh, I'm sorry I have this image I have this image frozen. Let me the get this image out of here. Fucking. Hold on. The sad part is that there is an entire culture out there that believes this is plausible. Plausible. That you can have sex with someone and not know who they are. Is this a reflection upon the intimacy in the bedrooms of the religious? Okay, thank you. Alright, so yeah, I already I, I demonstrated why Leah why uh, Jacob did not know it was Leah. Because in their culture, uh, the man went in first, and they came to bed veiled. They did not say anything um, for modesty. Whatever reason the culture was like that, I mean, that's recorded in history. That's, that's, that's historical fact. Uh, but as for, as for Tamar, right? So Tamar was married to Er, and then Er was, uh, er was killed because he was wicked. God killed them. And then Onan, Judah said to Onan, go into thy brother's wife and marry her, raise up seed to thy brother. Okay, remember now, if um, if the family name was not continued, it was a great disgrace. The inheritance was lost, so on and so forth. So the law was for the, the brother to go marry the deceased, the, the widow wife, the widow wife, and raise up seed to her brother. 
And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, right? Because the child is not, even though it's born by him, it, it's technically his brother's. Um, and so he did not, he, he spilled the seed on the ground, so on and so forth. And then <laughs> um, God killed him too for, for sinning against the Lord. And then Judah made a promise to Tamar saying, remain a widow at thy father's house till Sheila, Shalah, my son be grown. Uh, lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Okay, so Judah promised Tamar that he would uh, give her Shela, his son, to wife when he was old enough. All right, so she's waiting at her father's house, a widow, waiting for her, her husband to, be, uh, to become old enough. Um, so then what happens? Judah's wife dies. He goes up to Timnath. Um, and then Tamar hears this and a considerable time has passed and I'll show you that in, in the last verse, but she was lied to. She was not given Shalah as her husband. So what does she do? I do not, I do not justify this. I do not recommend this in any way. She covers herself in a veil and wraps herself. She sat in an open place, uh, on the way to Timnath and she waited for Judah Judah saw her. He thought her to be in a harlot because she had covered her face. Okay. So she was not a prostitute. She was pretending to be a prostitute. Okay. And then he said, let me, let me come in unto you. That's the King James version for, let me have sex with you. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. Okay. So she was in disguise. All right. And she wants a pledge from him. And then she, uh, he gives her a pledge and then they, they have sex. Um, illegally, this is fornication. All right. This is not, this is not good at all. Um, but the reason why that she, that Judah did not know who she was is because she purposely covered herself. She purposely hid her. Um, she, she probably, when they were having sex, refused to, to take off her veil or whatever. I don't really want to get into the logistics of all that, but she purposely, um, disguised herself. So that's, that's the answer to that question. And at the end of this, uh, Judah acknowledged then she had been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not Sheila, my son. So again, Judah promised to give her his son to, to marriage, and he didn't do that. So this is why Tamar took these little bit of unjustifiably extreme measures. Um, so yeah, that's why that's why they did not. Well, that's why Leah didn't know. That's why Jacob didn't know it was Leah, and that's why Judah did not know it was Tamar. So onwards we go. You can't even begin to say that the Bible isn't sexist if you don't. He hasn't demonstrated thus far. So let's see what else he's got in his ammunition. See it, it's probably because the church has conditioned you so well to only see the noble parts of the story. As my wife says. Okay, we'll look at this text. Deuteronomy 21, 10 through 14 that he, that he includes. He says this is sexist. Um, so when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have there to wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. She shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her. She shall remain in thine house. Bewail her father and her mother a full month. Yeah, so um, she's she survived the war. She was taken. She was not killed. Her father and her mother were killed. So she's given a period of one month to, to mourn her uh, mother and father. After that, thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money, for thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her. Okay, now there's two, there's two different interpretations of this. Um, this, when you have no delight in her, it's either before the marriage actually takes place. Henceforth, you know, it, if you really think a woman is beautiful, right, you see among the captives a beautiful woman. You, you want to take her from war instead of killing her, for one. You want to take her from war. This is the law, okay? This is see israel actually had laws god commanded laws that kept the people in check all right so it's easy to take a woman and just you know just have sex with her or rape her but this is not what god allowed you're supposed to take her home shave her head okay if she's really beautiful and you shave her head and you still love her okay that that's probably a sign that you actually love her all right you actually want to get married to her and you're not carried away by lust not only that she shall remain in that house a full month. So you can't even touch her for 30 days. All right, that's a Jewish calendar. One month, 30 days. You can't even touch her. You can't have sex with her for 30 days. You can't, you can't rape her, as the, guy, the author of this video is, is uh, implying. 
This is a protection for this woman, right? She has a full month to see if these people, if who, who took her actually wants to marry her. All right, and after the full month has passed and then um, he still wants to marry her, then 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 it's done, right? Uh, but if, if I, I, would, I would hold this interpretation that within this period of time, within the 30 days, if, if you find out that you do not have any delight in her, it's so like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe maybe with a shaved head, she's not that attractive or, yeah, you know, whatever it may be. Or maybe I was just uh, lusting after her after the, uh, before the third days. Then thou shalt let her go whither she will. She can go wherever she wants to go. You cannot sell her for money. You cannot make merchandise of her because you have humbled her. So either either you've humbled her by, by uh, bringing her to your house, shaving her head and doing all these things, making her wait the month. or Or he did marry her and then he found out that he did not like her. And he, he divorced her. Those are the two interpretations. Now, of course, divorce is not acceptable. Um, Jesus talks about this later in, in, the, in the scriptures. Um, I don't want to really go too far into this, but the only acceptable reason for divorce is fornication, adultery. Um, and if, uh, well, the, the only reason adultery was allowed, not adultery, excuse me, adultery is punishable by death. The only reason why divorce was allowed in the Old Testament, what Jesus said was because of the hardness of their hearts. Um, and that's a whole nother topic, but divorce is bad. Divorce is sinful. Um, and yeah, but what we see here, this is not, this is not some kidnap a woman and rape her. He couldn't touch her for 30 days. And even if he, if, if he wanted to divorce her after the marriage, he could not sell her. Um, he could not make merchandise of her. This is actually a protection. This is not just some, some, uh, rabid warfare going into a city killing everybody taking taking women and raping them and, and letting them go there, you see there's actually protection for women here um, contrary to what the author is trying to imply in, in his in his video here noble parts of the story as my wife says christian women don't tell men what they want because they've been conditioned their entire lives to stay quiet and pure if you say you want sex you're a slut yeah if if uh God sanctioned sex to be a wonderful thing between a man and a wife. Hear that, a man and a wife. Um, and sex is supposed to be within marriage, right? Within marriage. So yes, if you're trying to go and sleep around with people, that is a, uh, it's harlot behavior. It's whorish behavior. It's not acceptable. It's sin. It's fornication. It's sin. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're, <laughs> hey, you want sinful. sex, you're a slut. If you go after a man, you're a wanton. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing about that in the in the Bible. I mean, a woman can pursue a man. Obviously, she like there, there's guidelines. Like you're <laughs> not supposed to sleep with them. You're not supposed to. Well, there's a whole lot of guidelines, dirty language, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of stuff. But you want because they've been conditioned their entire lives to stay quiet and pure. Okay, being pure is a good thing, not only for women but for men. In fact, the Bible commands to again abstain from from sexual relations until marriage. So purity is it's a good thing, contrary to what the culture Four. teaches. If you say you want sex, you're a slut. Yeah, a woman should not be having sex before marriage, nor should a man. Okay, it goes both ways. But if you go after a man, you're a wanton whore. I mean, that's not really justifiable. It's not what the Bible says. If you want to establish yourself as an equal party in a relationship, you're a femme Nazi. Yeah, so women are equal in a relationship. Now, there are different roles. Now, this guy, this guy is thinking that because women were cursed to, to submit to their husbands, that because she a woman submits to her husband, she's inferior or lesser in some way. That's not what that means at all. Um, men and women are ontologically equal. They're, I probably shouldn't use that word. I don't really know a synonym for that word. I'm sorry. Um, naturally, they're, they're, their nature is equal, right? Where God made all nations of one flesh, man and woman, we're all one in Christ Jesus. We're equal. Now we have different roles on the other hand, okay? And that's that's the distinction. And I think he makes it later, This this he brings this point up later in the video that, oh, wait, men and women have different roles. God designed them to do different things. That's sexist. I don't see how that follows. God has a plan. He has a hierarchy for everything. Man is supposed to do one thing. Woman's supposed to do another thing. And when, these, when the genders, uh, when they balance each other out, it's a wonderful, blessed thing. Um, when people start playing their other gender and start doing things that God did not intend them for, to, that He did not design them for, that's when you have hierarchy. Uh, that's when you have the reversal of the hierarchies. You have uh, sin, you have wickedness, and uh, destruction comes after that. Sin always brings destruction. If you want to, yeah, women are not inferior to men in any way. Um, you just have different roles. Establish yourself as an equal party in a relationship. You're a femme Nazi. Women are clearly presented as property to be treated however a man pleases to treat them. 
Oh, no, not the case at all. Not the case at all. Um, in the scripture, it says actually that a woman is supposed to love, uh, excuse me, a man is supposed to love a woman as his wife, even as Christ died. And also elsewhere in the scripture, it says that there is no greater love than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. So if we're supposed to love our life, uh, excuse me, if we're supposed to love our wife in the same way that Christ um, showed his love that he died for us, there's no greater love than that than, than someone dying for you. Uh, do you think you treat you treat your wife that you love so much that you would die for her as property? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you might, but that's not the biblical. That's not the biblical way. That's not people who are Christians who are indulged with the Holy Spirit. We 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 love our wives. Um, we don't treat them as property. They're not um, they're not sexual slaves. Um, the Bible says we're one flesh. Um, I think elsewhere it says in in the text uh, in the scriptures. Uh, I can't remember. Too many verses, but we'll continue. Their function is strictly to... Women, women are, are respected, wives are, are loved in the scripture, and yeah, again, he has yet to provide a case in which the opposite is, is established. He's uh, provided a lot of verses which were out of context, which were completely contrary to culture and, and time and so on and so forth, but we'll be seeing. Women are clearly presented as property to be treated however a man pleases to treat them. Their function is strictly to be screwed and to raise children. Their only desirable trait is their sexuality, whether it is pure. On the other side of the token, a woman can be damned for her sexuality, whether it's stoning by rocks until dead for adultery. Okay, we're getting to the juicy parts of it now. Yeah, so all these claims that he has here on, on the, uh, the screen, he hasn't been able to justify any of them. He has not been able to use the Bible to justify any of them. Now let's get into the, let's, let's get into the, the nitty gritty here with these verses he's about to share. Reality. Whether it's oh yeah, also yeah, a woman can be damned for her sexuality if she's uh, if she's a whore. Adultery is punishable by death. Same thing for men. Adultery for men is punishable by death. You're not allowed to go around sleeping with whoever you want. Okay, Israel's God's chosen people. Israel has laws for God's chosen people, and in today's culture, you know it's perfectly fine to go sleep with whoever you want. Not in God's culture. Not in God's law. Mm -mm. Stoning by rocks until dead for adultery. Yep. Stoning by rocks for, but until dead for adultery, that applies to women. That also applies to men. Whoever's, whoever's guilty of adultery is killed uh, under the law without exception. Stoned by rocks until dead for not screaming loud enough for being raped. Oh, now this one's... Now this one... If you watch this video and you don't actually understand what the text is saying, this could really put you off here. But let me, let me, let's read the context. Deuteronomy 22, 23 through 24. 22, 23 through 24. Okay, so if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed, that means engaged to be married, unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then he shall bring them both out of the gate, out unto the gate of that city, and he shall stone them with stones that they die. Okay, the damsel, because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Wait a second, wait a second. So she's not, she's being stoned because she, um, wait. Okay, yeah, let me read it one more time, one more time. Then you shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and you shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath put, uh, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. All right. So because she cried not in the city, it implies, in fact, it proves that she was complicit in this adultery. So a man and a woman are found and she's betrothed, she's engaged to be married. She did not cry, which means she was not being raped. Uh, that means they're both complicit in in this adultery. This is the verse he provided. Hold on, let's, let's continue reading. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, um, interesting. If a damsel that a virgin betrothed be unto a husband and my man find her in the city, because she cried not. Okay, yeah, so his claim is that, let's listen to it one more time. Or reality, whether it's stoning by rocks until dead for adultery, stoned by rocks until dead for not screaming loud enough for being raped. Okay, yeah, not screaming loud enough for being raped. Let me show you why this is an impossibility. Okay, let me show you why this is an impossibility. Let me just hide this and this. So, this would be a depiction of a, a common house in Israel. 
All right, this is a depiction of a common house. Look how, how close, you know, some neighborhoods nowadays, the houses are close. Look how close this is. They don't have windows. They don't really have a door. Okay, some people might have had doors. Let me show you another depiction. Okay. Um, I can't remember where this picture's from. This is from, obviously it's a more modern picture, but this is this is somewhere out in the east. Uh, and this is, this is a typical village. You know, flat roof houses, all the houses are right next to each other. Everybody's just congregated together. Now, let me show you one more. All right, artist impression of a typical village house with a flat roof and central courtyard. Now let's read what, what this, this is from Women in the Bible, okay? This is, this, these people these people know the Bible isn't sexist, but here we go. A laneway connected the big house and its dependent smaller ones, while each group was separated from the next by an alley. Can I turn this back on? Yeah, okay, so you, see, so you can see. So these, these, these would be typical, like all, all three of these photos would be your typical, um, similarly typical, house in Israel. Um, so it says a laneway connected the big house and its dependent smaller ones while each group was separated from the next by an alley. So all these houses were separated by a tiny, uh, tiny alley in between them. The only means of communication through the town was along these alleys or more probably through the courtyards. Privacy was more or less unheard of. Okay. No doors, no windows. Privacy was more or less unheard of. Okay, they, they didn't have the insulation that we have in our nice houses today. So when this text when this text says this, um, wait, was I looking? Yeah, here we go. Wait a second. Oh no no okay, I apologize. I apologize. He quoted he quoted the wrong scripture actually. That's why I was confused. Um, let's take a look here. So. Um, here you go. Because she cried not being in the city. So we, we looked here, um, privacy was more or less unheard of. There was no privacy. You, you cannot scream in the city and people not hear it. Absolutely impossible. Obviously in the big cities today, you know, you could go in some alley and no one would be able to hear you. But in, in a place like this, if you screamed, everybody would hear you. If you were being raped and you screamed, you would have help instantly, instantly. So when this text says this, um, then you shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, you shall stone them with stones. If they die, the damsel, because she cried not. Um, oh my goodness. Forgive me. It's 530 in the morning. I'm, I'm powering through. Forgive me. But yeah, so she, she cried not. She cried not. The guy in the claim makes a video that she did not scream loud enough. That's why she's being put to death. Or disability. Whether it's stoning by rocks until dead for adultery, stoned by rocks until dead for not screaming loud enough for being raped. Yeah, not so like somebody could be killed for not screaming loud enough. The reality is if somebody screams, um, if somebody screams, oh, here we go. Um, for when he found her in the field and, and the betrothed damsel cried, there was none to save her. So if she's in a field and nobody, nobody could save her. Nobody could hear her. Only the man was put to death, right? But if she was in the city and she did not cry, that was an absolute guarantee that she was not being raped. She was consent. Uh, she was consenting in the adultery, therefore she was put to death. Because again, if she would have cried, somebody would have heard her. I guarantee you that 100%. But let's let's continue onwards here. We're almost we're almost to the end. Or discarded as worthless for being tainted by premarital sex. Yeah. So then he says, screaming loud enough for being raped, or just pretty much all of Proverbs, he makes a claim. You, you can't just quote an entire book and say, you know, use it to support your claim. So we're just going to throw this one. We're going to throw this one out because he didn't support it. Was Guarded as worthless for being tainted by premarital sex. Not a single being tainted by premarital sex. Yeah. You have to support that with scripture. A man, no matter how many wives he has, is accused of adultery. Not even Judah, who has sex with the prostitute that he tried to condemn to fire. After all, no one threatened to put him in the fire. Okay, I had to let that photo go. So he claims that no no man... After all, no one threatened to put adultery. Not even Judah, who has sex with the prostitute that he tried to condemn to fire. Yeah, so he said that him having sex with a prostitute is adultery. Let me show you why it was not adultery. It was fornication, which is sinful. 100% it was sinful, not good. But... It says... In the process of time, the daughter of Shua... Judah's wife died. His wife was dead. Okay. He was not cheating on his wife because 
she was dead. Now, of course, having sex with a prostitute is sin. It's, it's wicked. It's not justifiable. But he did not commit adultery. Property slash why? After all, no one threatened to put him in the fire. I apologize for these David photos. David is condemned for stealing another man's property slash wife when he takes Bathsheba. But he's not accused of cheating on his wives. I mean, one would assume if... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess we can just get used to this guy making these claims. He, in his mind, he thinks he's, he's justifiably shown that the Bible considers women as property. Uh, as, we have, he, as we have demonstrated, that is not the case. But he, he's just going to continue calling women property, so... Property slash wife when he takes Bathsheba. But he's not accused of cheating. Property slash after all, no one threatened to put him in the fire. David is condemned for stealing another man's property slash wife yeah. when he takes Yeah, he he yep, yeah, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba. But he's not accused of cheating on his wives. I mean, one would assume if you cheat with one woman, you've committed several cases of adultery if you have several wives. Yeah, he's right about that. David is guilty of multiple cases of adultery, no no question. Imagine how tainted Solomon's sexuality would be if you counted all of his wives as adulterous affairs. Luckily for them, men are not just sexual objects in the Bible, they're human beings. Women are plot devices depicted as inadequate, or not just on, sexual no. objects in the Bible, if you counted all of his wives as adulterous affairs. Imagine how tainted Solomon's sexuality would be if you counted all of his wives as adulterous affairs. Luckily for them, men are not just sexual objects in the Bible, they're human beings. Well, they weren't adulterous affairs because he was, he was married to them all. But as we'll see, uh, God did invent marriage to be between one man and one wife. And he's going to bring this, this topic up again, and I'll, I'll provide a verse for that when we get to that point. Women are... But yeah, having a thousand wives or 700 wives and 300 concubines, uh, terrible idea. And it's actually God commanded to not do that. He commanded kings to not... Uh, multiply wives. We'll see. We'll see that shortly. Plot devices depicted as inadequate, deceitful, and unreliable simply because they are women. They are a liability. Women present the obstacles that God has to overcome. Infertility, destroying paradise, defying the patriarchal structure, and endangering Yahweh's chosen people. Okay, so he, he puts up a bunch of synonyms here. Um, <laughs> with a bunch of names. And makes a whole bunch of claims. He provides no scripture. Women are plot devices. I, I don't understand what that means. The Bible's a history book. So, yes, Eve was recorded. Jairus' daughter was recorded. Pharaoh's daughter. They were all recorded in history. Shouldn't you be, um, shouldn't you be celebrating that these women have been recorded? Instead, he's, he's labeling them as plot devices. He's considering them as inadequate. Um, I don't understand that. Show me in the scripture, please. Deceitful. Yeah, again, the Bible's a history book. Eve um, Eve was deceived. Rebecca uh, was deceitful. Lot's daughters were deceitful. They raped Lot. Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife was deceitful. So because the Bible records these these sins that these women commit, all women are like that or something? You, do, you, do you think the Bible isn't... Is, do you think the only reason the Bible recorded these things is because these women did these things? The, the Bible recorded it because it happened in history unreliable eve job's wife yeah the bible never says that these people were unreliable you're adding your own synonym your own interpretation uh they were liability and their obstructions yeah blah 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 um i will point this out women don't count as witnesses that's not in the bible that's not uh it doesn't exist paradise uh, we'll continue Define on i mean it's just it's just a bunch of opinions patriarchal so. structure and endangering yahweh's chosen people by the way women are part of yahweh's chosen people um, so if you really want to look at how sexist the Bible is, you can read the stories of Ruth and Esther. Notice that both of these stories are about a woman's sexuality and needing to marry a man so they can thrive, I guess, under his protection. So you have two Bible books that the protagonists are women, um, and they're celebrated as, as wonderful women in the scriptures. And this is how he labels them, uh, because, because, you know, Nevertheless, the men in the Bible who are looking for wives, because women in the Bible are looking for wives, it makes the Bible sexist. It's a double standard. It's lo when the logic is carried through to conclusion, it's, it's fallacious. It's not 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 good. Not good at all. Thrive, I guess, under his protection. Of course, I should mention. By the way, uh, Ruth was um, she was the ancestor of Jesus Christ, and Esther saved the Jewish people from extermination. 
Yeah, imagine that. Thrive, I guess, under his protection. Of course, I should mention the exceptions to one of the points I just made. There are only five women that I can think of in the Bible who are not sexual objects that actually have an impact on the story that they're in. Four in the New Testament and one in the Old. The woman in the Old Testament is a bit suspect because it's very easy to say that she used the promise of sex to murder someone. The women in the New Testament are either the recipients of... Yeah, uh, okay, so J.L., the promise of sex to murder somebody, you can't show me that in the text. This is another opinion. Miracles, passive characters, or are domesticated hosts to men. I want to... Okay. Dem <laughs> he, I mean, honestly, like... He, he's doing everything he can to belittle the women. So any woman that does not fit his perspective in, in the Bible, he's considering them exceptions. And then he, he's, he's adding these own words himself to these women, calling them domesticated hosts and, you know, selling sex to jail, selling sex or whatever, offering sex to, to do what she did. Um, let me show you. Okay, I have to, hopefully this will work here. Um, let me see here. I hope this will work. Oh, crikey. Okay, hold on, hold on. Stand by. This is going to be intermission real quick. I have to add this and do this. Okay, all right, we're making progress. Stand by. Um, boom, okay. Boom, boom, boom. Thank you for your patience. I am quite, um, I don't want to say technically unsavvy i'm just i'm not i'm not used to these uh these these video things you know these video things uh boom okay okay hallelujah hallelujah i'm just gonna move this over here and we're gonna continue on with the final portion of this video now so he claims that Mar uh, mary and martha are um domesticated servants if that were the case let's listen the recipients of miracles domesticated passive servants, characters or our domesticated hosts. Domesticated hosts. Forgive me. Um, let's see. To men. If they're if they're nothing more than domesticated hosts, let's see. She had a sister called Mary. Is talking about Martha, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, so she was doing, she was doing her her domestic. Uh, let me one more time and see what he said. Are the recipients of miracles, passive characters, or our domesticated hosts. So yeah, she. I mean, the, these people were at their house. Um, Jesus and um, whoever else was with them, disciples, I suppose. And Martha was tending. She, she was, you know, playing the role of the host. But Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to Jesus. It says, but Martha was cumbered. She was overburdened about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. So Martha says, oh, my sister Mary should come and help me doing my domesticated hosts, as he says, um, services. What does Jesus say? Did he say, oh, yeah, um, yeah, Mary, you're, you're only good for, for serving us. You're, that's all you're good for. Go ahead and go help your sister. Oh, that's not what we see here. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So Mary chose to do the right thing, which is to, to sit and listen to Christ's teachings. And in Christ, if, if, if women truly were just domestic, uh, not domesticated servants, I'm sorry. To the recipients hosts, of miracles, um, passive characters, or our domesticated hosts. Domesticated hosts. If they were just domesticated hosts, and if that's what God intended women to be in the Bible, then surely Jesus would have rebuked Mary and said, go help Martha serve us. But you know, that's not what we see at all. This is not what we see from our Lord. Um, Mary was listening to our Lord speak, and Jesus uh, rightly commended her for doing so. Uh, Mar uh, Mary has chosen that good part. Okay, let's continue. To men. I want to make something clear about this video. I'm not isolating the sexist portions of the Bible. The Bible's already done that for... I, I think he is. Think for he is. me. Women are only oh. in the Bible for their sexuality. Lots of... Very bold claim. I don't see any scripture. Otters don't have any additional content written about them where they struggle to find food, start a business, or do some incredible feat that improves society. No, Lot's daughters have two stories about them being offered to a rape mob and then raping their own father. Yeah, I mean, this, is, uh, this isn't a, a very good argument. 
because a biography was not written about two women, the Bible is sexist. Um, yeah, if, if every single truth was written in the Bible about God and his people and what they did, nobody would ever be able to finish it. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. 66 now. <laughs> um, and it has what we need in it. It doesn't have... Um, I mean, it certainly could have more extra things in it, but like I said, if it had everything, we would never finish it. So God has included in his word what he wants us to know. All right, and say that, oh, because their story was not included, that the Bible's sexist. Now, it might doesn't follow. seem like I'm cherry-picking, but I'm not. You can look at the narrative of any woman in the Bible and see the same problem. Not only are the narratives troubling, but so are the rules that this Bible culture keeps. Women are tr another okay another claim and no scripture treated as chattel. The creation story makes it clear women were created to be used by men. Yeah okay we this was the very first point that he made in the beginning it says uh, talking about Noah's ark and the animals, um, his female right but I I, I explained um, could easily be said her male and your your wife. Your husband, my wife, um, it's just it's, it's the way uh, it's the way words work. So, uh, but then he says, creation story makes it clear women were created to be used by men. Yeah, then he says the, uh, the creation story makes it clear that women are made to to be used by men. But the creation story was was made or it was it was written and, and preserved to show us that we need a savior. Sort of as an afterthought. Polygamy was perfectly fine, but you won't see one wife with several husbands. The one time this is brought up, it's by Jesus, and it's a euphemism for the woman being a slut. Okay. Alright. The an afterthought. Polygamy was perfectly fine. Poly polygamy is not fine. Let me, let me find the text here. So this is in regard to Solomon and David. I think, I think he mentions this right after, but it says, When you set a king over you whom the, the Lord God will choose talks about he will not he should not multiply or he shall not multiply horses to himself this is a commandment he should not uh, cause people to return to egypt uh, and then after this he says neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold so wives are not uh, supposed to be in the plural god commanded one wife one woman in genesis 224 says a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife one wife they shall be one flesh, not multiple fleshes, not multiple wives. It was it was a direct command to kings that they would not multiply wives to themselves. Uh, polygamy is in no no uh, by no means acceptable. God allowed it for for the hard because their hearts were hard. Same reason why He allowed divorce, which now it's Jesus. He He demonstrated to us that there is no just reason for divorce, um, and I believe for the, for the same reason. Uh, polygamy was allowed because of the hardness of their hearts, but God originally intended one man, one woman for a marriage. But you won't see one wife with several husbands. The one time this is brought up, it's by Jesus, and it's a euphemism for the woman being a slut. Yeah, so she she was um, she did have multiple multiple husbands. She was in adultery. She didn't have multiple husbands at the same time, though. Well, well she she left one and went to another one. She she wasn't. Um, with them all at the same time, but technically, since divorce is not justified, that constitutes as adultery. Because if you leave, if you leave your spouse unjustly, you're still considered to be married with them. So if you if you have sex with somebody else, since you're t you're still married to your husband, if you leave for an unjust reason, it's it's adultery. But yeah, um, a man having multiple wives not acceptable. A woman having multiple husbands not acceptable. Um, one man, one wife. Never mind the hundreds of wives that David and Solomon had. They aren't sluts. They're not male sluts either. They are human beings. Men keeping female concubines is okay. Wives are considered property. Keep in mind, this is a rule from God's mouth. This isn't just the culture of the day. Yeah, it's a rule from God's mouth, huh? Yeah, right here. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. They were not allowed to have multiple wives. Um, wasn't allowed. It's perfectly fine to sell daughters into slavery. <laughs> yeah, okay, let me let me find the verse here. So, 
uh, if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the, uh, men servants do. Of course, again, I, I disagree with the term slavery. Um, servant and the connotations are over a better, uh, better term to use. But in, in the situations of a most dire poverty, um, it, wa it was indeed allowed for a man to sell his daughter uh, to be a maidservant. Now, of course, okay, there, you, you take this one verse out of context, it sounds horrible, but there's actually laws, okay? Um, there's, there's many more laws that go along with this. If somebody is so poor that they have to sell themselves or their, or their daughter into slavery, th their family, their kin is actually commanded to redeem them, okay? Their kin is to, commanded to, to purchase them and set them free, to redeem them. All right, just one quick revision I have to make here. So I said that the family or the near kin were commanded to redeem someone that had sold themselves into servanthood. This is, I, I spoke wrongly in saying this. It was not a command, but it was an express right that they held, especially in, in the instance of an Israelite selling themselves to a heathen or a non-Israelite master. It was, so it was not a it was not a direct explicit command command in the scriptures, although it's a right that was held by the by the Jews that they could redeem their uh, near of kin. Now there's there's also there's a lot more that can be said about that, but th this for another time, um, another video. But in Exodus twenty one seven, this redemption does not apply to a woman uh, who is sold as a maidservant by a father, expressly for this reason. If she were to get married, marriage, marriage is a covenant that is it's supposed to be permanent. It's supposed to be permanent. So if she's married to the person that she's sold to, she has the full rights of a wife. And nobody can come and, and redeem her from that uh, because she's in a marriage covenant. Now, of course, we'll see in, in this passage here that she doesn't actually end up getting married. And the inevitable result of that is then shall she go out free without money. She's redeemed um, because... The master lied about his 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 vow, but you'll see that in a second. So let me let me um, let me reiterate. It was not an express command in the scripture to redeem someone that had sold themselves into, into servanthood. It was a right that they held, um, and for a woman that was sold by her father, she would be redeemed 100 percent unless she actually was was married. But of course, in this passage, that's not what happens. All right, back to it. Uh, and I don't think this happened very often, um, but if, if this did happen, or when it did happen, that a man would sell his daughter as a servant, a maid servant, um, she was pro uh, provided rights here, which is what we'll see. But let's see what he says in the video. And reading the verse carefully, it looks like they're talking about sexual slavery. If that daughter doesn't please her master, she can be let go. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll make this point one more time. Um, Please don't take what anybody says and believe them if, if, if they uh, make a claim about anything, whether it be the Bible or anything else. Because I will, I will agree with you. If you just look at this, if you don't have any understanding of the Bible and you look at this, it, it seems enticing. It seems like what he's saying is true. But when we actually look at the text, let's look at the text and see what it's actually saying. If she please not her master, who what? Who hath betrothed her to himself? What does that mean? It means to be engaged to himself. Then shall he let her be redeemed. You don't you don't have sex until you're married. You don't have sex when you're engaged. This is clearly not talking about a sexual um, someone being sold into servanthood for for sex only. If she if she please not her master. Let's, let's listen to what he says. Doesn't time. Carefully, it looks like they're talking about sexual slavery. Sexual slavery. Okay. If that daughter doesn't please her master, she can be let go. Yeah. So, if she please not her master. Who hath betrothed her to himself, who is engaged, right? There's no having sex until after the marriage, not when they're engaged. Then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her into a strange nation. He shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. What does this mean? He's d dealt deceitfully with her? I'll tell you exactly what it means. He promised to marry her, and then he ended that promise. He, he actually refused to marry her. So, so he purchased her with the intention of marrying her, which again, you, you can't can't force somebody to marry you can't force somebody to have sex with you so she made the promise to the woman that he would marry her okay and she was looking forward to this promise but he dealt deceitfully with her so he made a promise to her and he lied to her he ended up not marrying her in this instance 
he was to let her be redeemed, to go free. He could not sell her, uh, even though she was a servant. She, Before that, she could have served him in the house or whatever, um, whatever their duties were that they assigned to them. Uh, but if he promised to marry her and then lied, then she was to be set free. She cannot be sold. Let her be redeemed. And if he hath betrothed her into his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. Okay, so we have more protections for women here. Um, she's supposed to be treated as his own daughter. She's supposed to be given food, clothing, and the, the duty of marriage. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. So if he does take another wife, which is not, not a good thing, um, but for the hardness of the hearts, if he were, she can't be neglected. She's promised to, to have food, clothing, um, and her duty of marriage is not neglected. And if, if they don't do any of these things, then she shall go out free without money. Okay, so let's uh, let's continue. He, he he makes a false claim, which if you don't understand the scripture, you could he, he could get away with this. And you may think that the Bible teaches that you, know, you could sell your daughters to be sex slaves, but that's not what the Bible teaches at all. In the book of Numbers, the book where a giant census is taken, the women aren't even counted. When Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then the 4,000 a second time, that's 9,000 men total, no women were counted. There's even verses specifically saying this. Yeah, so I, this, this kind of goes with the same thing. Um, let me, let me, okay. Yeah, so I'll play this back one more time. Jesus feeds the 5,000 members, the book where a giant census is taken, the women aren't even counted. When Jesus feeds... Okay, in the book of Numbers, the women are not counted. I don't see how this proves the Bible is sexist. It's like the, the thing with Lot's daughters. Because their story was not recorded, the Bible is somehow sexist. Because the book of Numbers does not record the women, um, the Bible is somehow sexist. I don't see how that follows at all. But, I mean, we can look at the book of Numbers here and we can see what the book of Numbers says. Um, Numbers, chapter 1. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with a number of their names, every male, hmm, every male, why? From 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war, oh, you see, they didn't send women to war, you know. Um, the men were the ones that went and died for their country, for their families. So why did, uh, may maybe if the guy would actually, the author of this video would have read the text, why were they not numbered? Because the point of this numbering was to go to war. Not that this, I mean, even if it didn't say this, not that it would prove that the Bible was sexist in any way. Um, but we'll continue. Feeds the 5,000 and then the 4,000 a second time, that's 9,000 men total. No women were counted. There's even verses specifically saying this. Yeah, I mean, no women were counted. Like I said, I don't see how this proves, um, proves that the Bible is sexist. And there's multiple interpretations on this. Um, but I, I'll just point out one thing. Um, the, the the it was a patriarchal society right uh, patriarchal society men were were typically recorded so on and so forth but when jesus came on the scene and he started preaching you actually see met women and children being mentioned okay the reason the reason why they weren't numbered specifically like i said there's multiple interpretations i did a lot of research on it i could not find um was was there not enough women there to even number them um so on and so forth but like i said even like logically um, just because they're not numbered does not prove that the Bible is sexist. No women were counted. There's even verses specifically saying this. There are several incidents in the Old Testament where God commands his people to commit... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking now. I'm starting to lack on this, this uh, scene change here, but... Okay, so... Genesis. There are several incidents in the Old Testament where God commands his people to commit genocide. Yeah, correct. In the Old Testament, God commanded to commit genocide on certain nations. Now let's take a look here. Judges 21. Judges chapter 21. He's wrong here. He's wrong here again. If he would have read the text, he would have understood. God is not commanding this. Uh, in fact, the, the, the theme of the book of Judges here, let me just fast forward to the bottom. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, So people are doing what they think is right. And this is exactly what happens here in Judges 21. Um, the tribe of Benjamin was almost completely wiped out. I believe there were 600 people left in Benjamin. Yeah, 600, I believe, is all that was left of the entire tribe. And then they were, they were grieving. So how could this come to pass in Israel, that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? So what do they do? They come up with a plan. The congregation come together. And they say, 
how, how shall we do for wives for them that remain? You know, we killed all their wives. We, we killed everybody in Benjamin except for 600 people. So how are we going to prevent this tribe from being totally annihilated? Oh, I got a great idea. I got a great idea. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Jabesh Gilead and kill everybody there, our own brothers, and, and take their wives. Oh, great idea. So they go take 400 young virgins. God didn't command this. They, every, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But sit, they're lacking 200, 200 women. So what are they going to do? What are they going to do? So they, they come up with another plan. There's a, there's a feast in Shiloh every year. Feast in Shiloh every year. And, and another one of their brothers owned the city of Shiloh. Ephraim owned Shiloh. So what do they do? They go to the vineyards. They hide. Said, go, command the children of Benjamin, go in line, wait in the vineyards and hide. See if the daughters come out to dance the dances. Go out and catch them. Kidnap them. They're kidnapping their own brothers and sisters. Or they're, they're, they're kidnapping from their brothers, their their own sisters, um, their own tribes. Now they're not, um, you know, they're not super closely related, but they all, they're all related, you know. Um, they're all, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That that's that's the theme of this book here, and God commanded specifically, you shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. When people do what they think is right, bad things happen. Bad things happen. Now, as for Numbers chapter 31. Oh, my. She's barking in her sleep. Come on, do it again. Oh, she just did it two times. Oh, well. Anyways. Numbers chapter 31. This is genocide, okay? When God gave the promised land to Israel, he commanded to genocide certain groups. Now, you ask... How could God command to genocide certain people? Isn't he loving? Uh, let's find the text here. So when God was telling the Israelites, he said, Don't think I'm, I'm taking you into this land because you're righteous or you're good. Don't, don't say, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me into to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Okay. So these nations, the Midianites, they, uh, they sacrificed their children in fire. Okay. They had sex with animals, okay? They were worshiping false gods, okay? They were wicked and sinful and depraved, and uh, they were worthy of judgment. And just like how God flooded the world, because every, every thought of every man's heart was only evil continually, God used a flood to judge those people. This time, God is using his chosen people, Israel, to judge those people. Okay, so instead of sending a flood to kill them all, God is sending Israel themselves, his chosen people, to kill them all as a judgment because they're wicked. You know, you don't, you can't. When, when the when the entire nation is okay with sacrificing children in fire, you got a big problem there. But when, when our entire nation is okay with killing babies in the womb, yeah, we got a big problem. It's going to get worse too. But yeah, so um, they they slaughter the, the the Midianites were drawing them into idolatry, into adultery, and. Um, Moses found out about this, and then he commanded to kill them all, but they they saved the women. Uh, so he commanded to kill every male, kill every male, because, you know, the males can revolt. Uh, and we see this later in the scriptures also, when God, because there, there are some nations that, that Israel did not completely wipe out. God warned them. He said, these wicked nations are going to draw you away after other gods. They're going to draw you to their abominable practices, worshiping children and or, sacrificing children in fire as a form of worship to their gods god warned them if they did not if they did not put this wickedness out of their land that they will be drawn into it and we see later in the bible that's exactly what happens so god commands to kill every male so these males do not uh, later rise up and revolt against them even the little children uh, even the little male children kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. So these women were the ones that were partaking in the sins. They were drawing Israel away to worship false gods and into adultery and into wicked, wicked practices. And you have to, you have to understand um, when I say worshiping false gods, that includes their practices. That includes making uh, burning children in fire and uh, having sex with animals, which was a part of their, their uh, God worship and so on and so forth. And God was not having this. God was, uh, God chose Israel. They were his chosen people. And he would not allow this wickedness in his land. So he commanded to kill every male, even the male children. Kill every woman that had committed these sins. Uh, um, because if they were of age and they've known man, 
they were, I mean, the whole nation was corrupt. They were guilty of these things. They were, they were to be judged. But the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Yeah, so these were spared. They were shown mercy. And as we looked at uh, some of the things earlier, um, um, there's there's laws protecting servants. Uh, you can't just take a woman. Like we, we looked at the, the, the verse earlier talking about how she has to shave her head and there's a 30-day 30 30 day waiting period. Okay, you can't just take this woman and rape her. All right, there, there's a process and there's a just process too. After that 30 days, 30 days, if they if they still want to get married, if they actually um, are, are willing, um, then bada boom, bada bing. But if not, then she's she's to go free. Uh, let's see what he has to say. But keeping the young virgin women from the targeted city of destruction is perfectly fine. They can. Yeah, they're spared. Um, it's definitely better to be a servant in a nation that has laws to protect servants. Remember, let me remind you one more time. Uh, some of their laws were if you stole somebody and sold them, you'd be put to death. And if somebody was a, a wicked master or cruel master, the servant could run away. And um, they were not allowed to be returned to their master. So, he, yeah, he's right. He's right in saying this. The city of destruction is perfectly fine. They can be taken with the other animals and property. Whoa, well, hold on. He called them property. The city of destruction is perfectly fine. Yeah, it's perfectly fine to save, yep, save the young one, the young uh, women that were not known by men. Because again, the old ones were, um, they, they committed the abominable practices of, of their God worship and so on and so forth. But They can be taken with the other animals and property. And that, that's, that's the problem he has there. He links uh, women in with property once again, um, which, yeah. And of course down here he says that women are seen as property. Again, he has not through this entire time established that. They are referred to as booty, plunder, and are lumped in with other stolen goods. Show me in the Bible, please. That they're referred to as booty or plunder or property. Um, yeah. The city of destruction is perfectly fine. They can be taken with the other animals and property. All right, so somehow I managed to skip the last passage that he, he included. Uh, but we're going to take a look at that right here. So Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 14 reads, When thou comest nigh to a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. And thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. All right, so first thing that needs to be mentioned, this was not a genocide commanded by God. Now, it is true, there were seven nations in, in Canaan that God did command to completely and, and totally destroy. Women, children, cattle, all of the above. They were all commanded to be destroyed because of their vile uh, wickedness and sin. The animals were, were commanded to be destroyed because the people in their worship to their gods were committing bestiality. They were having sex with the animals, so those animals were defiled. Uh, so they had to be killed. Uh, these nations were sacrificing their children in fire. Uh, and it was the custom of their God worship to do so. And so on and so forth. The whole nation was corrupt and wicked. And God wanted no part of that to spread to Israel. So God commanded the total extermination of these nations. And we see here that God is not commanding a genocide against these people. This is a war for some reason. Okay, Israel is supposed to be a holy and just nation. They're not allowed to start wars with people for no reason. So it's safe to assume that this is a 100% justified war with some other nation that's not the seven nations of the Canaanites. Uh, either, whatever the reason may be, uh, this other place, this other city started war with Israel and Israel is coming to end it, hence they offer peace. Um, or maybe this nation teamed up with some other nation to attack Israel, so on and so forth. Whatever the reason, it's going to be a justified reason because God as, or as Israel, Israel as God's people, are not allowed to fight unjust wars. So this is the commandment from the Lord here. They're supposed to come nigh to the city and then proclaim peace unto it. And if they make peace, then they will be their servants. They'll be their tributaries and they will serve them. But if they do not make peace with them, they will besiege it, make war against thee, um, and besiege them. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. So they had a, they had an opportunity to make peace. 
they refused, so God goes in and kills all the people. Excuse me. Is, uh, God delivers the city. Israel goes in and kills all the people that are able to fight so they don't revolt. Of course, they had the opportunity to, to surrender, but they didn't. So every male is killed so they don't revolt in the future. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. So the women are spared. Even the ones that aren't virgins are spared. Because this city is not, um, they're not guilty of vile, vile sin. Um, all the children are spared, spared, even the male children. And they take their animals, they take all their spoil, everything that they have, they take. And he uses this as an example of, of sexism. Um, again, I'm not really sure how this follows. The men are the one killed. <laughs> we, we, could, we could make a whole video about how the Bible is misandrist because the men are the ones who always get the short end of the stick but the men are the, are the men are the ones that are killed the women and the children are spared and again of course we looked at these laws but there are laws that require israel to deal with them in a certain way they're supposed to be treated fairly they're supposed to be treated uh, in the way that god commanded to treat strangers and servants uh, so to say that this is sexist because the women are spared in fact this is a this is a favorable favorable outcome again it's better to be subjected to a nation that has laws to protect you than to be killed. Uh, so, yeah, this does not follow that this text is sexist. God bless. Back to it. There's the tale of Queen Vashti, whom King Xerxes wanted to parade in front of his banquet hall to be shown off as a hottie. She didn't go, so they simply got rid of her as an example to all wives of how they should behave when their husband asked them to do something. Granted, this is just a story about a different culture, but no one's ever protesting that that's something wrong. That's wrong. There you go. It's, it's sinful. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't the Jewish culture. It was the uh, Persians, I believe it was. Let me look really quickly to verify that for you. Esther. Chapter 1. Ahasa, 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 Ahasuerus. Um. Yeah, the power, the power of Persia and media. Yeah, so it wasn't Israel. But yeah, what he did was wrong. There you go. Not just find that. In churches still today, women are denied leadership positions because Paul wrote that women should be silent in churches and must not have authority over men. When my wife and I were looking for new churches back when we were still Christian, this was an issue that popped up several times, and it's interesting to watch the men squirm as they try to explain to my wife why she can't have a leadership position in the church. All right, interesting to watch the men squirm. I'll tell you why men uh, men are the leaders in the church and women are not to be leaders in the church. One, because of the curse on woman in, in Genesis. Uh, their desire will, will be to their husband because Eve did not want to ask her husband's advice. Now she has no choice but to... to um, um, she she's under her husband's rule now because she didn't want to ask the advice. That's the curse. Uh, and two, yeah, the Bible explicitly says uh, God has decreed that the man's role is to be leadership in the church and the woman's role is not to be leadership in the church. Um, that's the way it is. I mean, you can call that sexist. You can, you can make your arbitrary definition of sexist because God has designated a hierarchy for how things work. Um, it does not mean that women are lesser than men in any way. It's just men do certain things and women do other things, okay? It's um, not very hard to explain. Basically, it came down to you have a vagina. The Bible is extremely cruel to women who are raped. I've heard time and time again from modern-day Christians, mind you, about how these rules about raped girls are there to protect these raped girls. Generally, they're not talking about how non-virgin brides can be stoned to death or how women who don't scream loud enough while being raped can be stoned to death or just... Non-virgin brides can be stoned to death. Yeah, Deuteronomy 22.13. Let's take a gander at that. You know, Israel was a pretty... You know, like, again, I said... Um, like, uh... How do I say? Israel was God's chosen people and Israel was expected to follow God's laws. And if people broke God's laws, they would be punished. That's the way it is. And that's something you can consider. Have you broken God's law? Are you a sinner? Have you ever told a lie? God hates liars. He calls liars abominations. 
lying is an abomination to him. So how will you be forgiven by him? Yeah. Christ is the only way. Um, and God is, is quite strict, quite strict in, in his judgments. So Deuteronomy 22, 13. Uh, let's take a look here. Sorry. 22, 13 through 21. Your says, allies can be stoned. Are there to protect these raped girls? Generally, they're not talking about how non-virgin brides can be stoned to death or how women who don't scream loud enough while being... Yeah, 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 exactly. So he says, uh, give occasion to speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her. So if a man takes a wife and he says these things, I, uh, and he says, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. She was not a virgin. So she obviously, she lied to him and she told him that she was a virgin. Um, and then this, this process goes on. And if, she, if it's found out that she was a virgin and the man was incorrect, he is chastised, he's disciplined, he pays a hefty fine because he's brought an evil name upon the damsel. He's, I mean, he's slandered his, his wife's name. But if it's true that his, his, his uh, wife, who, who certainly told him that he was pure, um, was a liar and that she was uh, sleeping around, yeah, she gets stoned. She hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. Yeah, God, God's not playing around with his chosen people. I mean, I know in today's culture it's okay to, they, they say it's okay to sleep around with whoever you want. Yeah, God did not allow that. He does not allow that. Raped can be stoned to death, or just your average slut can be stoned to death. Yeah, and of course he mentions, um, Brides can be stoned to death, or how women who don't scream loud enough will be... Women not screaming loud enough, but we, we established already. We looked at the, the typical... Uh, typical um, layout or the house of of the uh, cities in Israel. There was no privacy there. If somebody screamed in a city, they would be heard. So, therefore, if somebody did not scream, they were consenting to the uh, the the sex, and they were committing adultery, and they would be put to death. Both of them, by the way, the woman was not just killed, or the man, you know, reprimanded. They were both put to death. Adultery is. Uh, by death. Being raped can be stoned to death, or just your average slut can be stoned to death. Yeah, your your average slut, like you know, I mean, obviously his worldview says it's okay. You can have sex with whoever you want. Um, yeah, we'll get into that in a moment. No, they're talking about the rules where a woman is forced to marry her rapist, because, as they say, in the Bible's day and age. Okay. Yeah. So again, this is, <laughs> I can't make this point enough. If you just watch this video and you don't actually research what he's saying. You would be inclined to believe him because the, this seems plausible what he's saying. But let's take a look at the actual test, text here. So this is um, this is what we looked at earlier. She did not cry in the city, so they're both stoned. They're both guilty. Uh, keep that in mind. They're both guilty, so they're both killed. Now, verse 25, if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her. Okay, keep that in mind. The man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. Okay, so the, only the man is killed because he raped her. Rape is punishable by death. All right. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. Yeah, so rape punishable by death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So murder, if someone rises up against his neighbor and murders him, even so is the matter of rape punishable by death. For he found her in the field and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her and they, get this, they be found they be found, okay? This, this implies that there's, uh, there's um, two parties in action here. It's not just, it's not just one woman that's, that's being saved from a rapist. Uh, it's they be found. They're both complicit in this action. Then the man that, man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Now, the, of course, the contention here is this. Verse 25 says, if a man force her, put to death. This is no question about it. This is rape, right? But th this, this understanding here, you read lay hold on her. 
if you're if you don't understand the, the original language the hebrew or the context it could seem like this is rape but the, okay let me let me show you does man force her lay hold on her there's actually two different words in hebrew two different words so verse 25 here verse 20 all right hopefully this is the last correction i have to make uh when i was first recording the video i did not realize until i i'm just now going back and, and proofing the video that the words i was showing i was actually covering up so you could not see what I was talking about. So I'm just going to cut that part out. I'm going to put this part in and we're going to take a look at the Hebrew words and demonstrate why his claim that women were forced to marry the rapists is false. So first, first point to look at here is the man force her. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, the inevitable consequence of that is death. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. Okay. So a man who rapes a woman is put to death. All right. And notice here, the word is force her. This is un. Uh, undoubtedly rape and the consequence is death now verse 28 here says if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found all right so first the first thing to mention here is lay hold on her versus man force her they're already two different terms and we're going to take a look at the hebrew here and demonstrate that they're totally two different words so if they were if these were both instances of rape first of all they would use the same uh, word so let's look at verse 25. If a man force her. All right, let me scroll up, make sure you can see the word. Yeah, there we go. So it says, but if in the countryside, uh, countryside finds a man, a young woman betrothed and forces her, okay? So the word is vehehezik, vehehezik. All right, this is clearly rape. And if we look at the root word, uh, it's it means to be or grow firm or strong to strengthen. All right, in this context, it means 100% rape. So Vehechazik. Deuteronomy 28. Lay hold on her. Let's look at that passage. Uh, it finds a man, a young woman who's a virgin, who not is betrothed, and seizes her. Okay, remember the word was chazik. Alright. Totally different word right here. The word is utefasa. Utefasa. Alright, and it's he seizes her. Now let's look at the root word and see what it means. The fas, to lay hold of or to wield all right so all such who handle the harp so when you wield an instrument for example you handle the harp you play the harp okay in today's slang look at this uh if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and and lay hold on her and wields her or plays her you could say so to speak uh, in today's vernacular he plays her convinces her entices her um seduces her to lie with her him and they be found and then she shall be his wife. Okay, so there's one thing. Uh, he handled the harp. She caught him by the garment. She she held him by the garment. This is talking about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And I have this this write up from uh, from this apologist, uh, Doctor Bonson, Greg Bonson. It says the Hebrew word tafas, lay hold of her, emphasized above, simply means to take hold of something, grasp it in hand, and by application to capture or see something. It is the verb used for handling the harp and flute, the sword, the sickle, the shield, the oars, and the bow. It is likewise used for taking God's name in vain or dealing with the law of God. Joseph's garment was grasped, uh, even as Moses took the two tablets of the law. The Hebrew verb to handle, grasp, capture does not in itself indicate anything about the use of force. Okay, and I wrote here, you can take someone's wife. Uh, people say um, you could take her virginity. Uh, you can take a bride to be your wife. You could take someone in your arms. Taking does not ne uh, necessitate force, right? It does not necessitate force. So in this instance, in Deuteronomy 25, 22, 25, a man forces her, then the man is put to death, okay? Lay hold on her, takes her, seduces her, uh, and lies with her, and they be found, she shall be his wife. So two different words here. Two different complex uh, contexts and applications and one is rape and the other one is not rape and there's a there's a passage in exodus i believe exodus 22 16 it says if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her he shall surely endow her to be his wife okay so if he entices a maid seduces her takes her plays her whatever word you want to use there uh and seduces her and sleeps with her then he is required to marry her. It's, this is to prevent somebody from just sleeping with as many women as he wants and just running away and um, 
I forgot the term. I forgot the modern day term, but basically he is required to uh, pay the consequences for what he's done. He can't just sleep with people and leave them. If he sleeps with, with uh, a woman who is not married, who's because if, if, if they're married, if she's married, they're both put to death. But she's not married. Um, he is required to marry her. Um, and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her and he may not put her away all his days. And he's not allowed to divorce her ever. So, judging by the words here, two separate words, uh, two different applications. And yeah, this is how we, it's called biblical exegesis. This is how we look at a text um, with, uh, this is how we look at a text, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, with diligence. I'll say that with diligence. So clearly one's rape, the other one is seduction. It's not rape. And his claim crumbles. Back to the video. And that's that. That's that. Two different Hebrew words, two different contexts and, and definitions. Um, but if, if, you, if you just look at the video by itself and you don't research it, you might think the, the Bible teaches this. is forced to marry her rapist. Because, as they say, in the Bible's day and age, a raped girl was absolutely worthless. Couldn't make a living, couldn't feed herself. Since she was used goods and had no value now that her sexuality had been tainted, she wasn't good to anyone, so she had to be married to this rapist so he could take care of her. Any person that thinks that this is actually a good system is a megalomaniac, and their brain has obviously been corrupted by... Yeah, so obviously, that's not the system. If that were the system, that, that would be a problem that people could just... You know, they see someone they like and they go rape them and it's guaranteed marriage. Yeah. Rapists are put to death, just just like it says in the text. Um, in, in the manner of someone who, who murders their neighbor, so is, is the manner of rape. They're put to death, so. Their religion and their morality system has been perverted by a system that is obviously wrong. Hold on, buddy. Hold on. Hold on, buddy. You call yourself an atheist, so morality does not exist. Okay, I don't want to go into this long this long conversation here, but if you're an atheist, then truth does not exist, right? If we're just a if we're just a collection of random molecules that just uh, ran, uh, rapidly expanded and then created life and so on and so forth, it's all random, dude. There's no there's no morality. There's no truth. There's nothing holding you back from doing whatever you want. Now you can impose you can impose restrictions in your mind because they make you feel better, or because society says something about them, but you don't have morality. No atheist can say that they have a morality. Okay, I was an atheist before too for a long time. Morality requires objective truth. If there's no objective lawgiver, someone who's um, telling us, someone who knows everything, who knows what, what is good and what is evil and who tells us the difference, if there's no objective lawgiver, then you cannot, you cannot impose, you, cannot, you don't even have morality. You can't say you have morality. And you definitely can't uh, offer your opinion on other morality. Because if everything is random, it's a random collection of atoms, truth doesn't exist. Is this really the best God could do? Priests have special rules for themselves in the Old Testament. They can't marry used women. It seems that a woman who has already been had is of no use to a holy man. If a priest's daughter starts acting like a slut, she's to be burned alive at the stake. Okay, let's take a look here. Thou shalt not take a wife that is a whore. Yeah, obviously. And how much more so for uh, a priest who is to represent God's people before God? What does it look like if a, if a priest who's supposed to be holy and set apart marries a prostitute? It's not a, it's not a good look. God wants, not only does he want his people to be upright, sanctified, just, and holy, but especially the priest that, that represents the people before God. How much more so for him? So there's no question about that, why a whore is not acceptable to be married to a priest. Um, I mean, it, it shows you this guy's worldview. It's like, let's listen to him more time. The acting like had is of no use to a holy man. A woman who's had. Yeah, he, he, he neglected the harlotry part. Uh, but I suppose according to his worldview, maybe prostitution is okay. Maybe sleeping with whoever you want is okay. Not according to God's word. Not according to God's word. And then the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father. She shall be burnt with fire. Okay. The same thing applies to, to a son. All right. Just, it doesn't apply to just a woman. A man can't just go and sleep with whoever he wants and profane his father and, and pay, uh, pay no penalty or punishment. Um, 
same thing applies just like how we looked at it very in the very beginning her wife she's no that's not right his wife her husband um interchangeable here if the daughter is uh, profaning herself by playing the whore if the son is is doing the same they're both put to death uh, burnt burnt with fire yeah if a priest's daughter starts acting like a slut she's to be burned al- acting like a slut like it's it's that's okay to do live at the stake there are no rules for if a priest's son is sleeping around i mean that'd just be barbaric with certain rules, we start to see the fascination that Christianity and early Judaism had with the vagina, and how scared of it they truly were. Despite reducing women to the role of a life support system for a vagina, it's pretty clear that these Abrahamic religions are disgusted by their fascination with it. Women who give birth will be unclean for seven days if they have a son, twice as long if they have a daughter. After the birth, she must make a sin offering. That's right. A sin offering. Yeah, so let's take a look at this. There is something called ceremonial uncleanness. Um, there were several things that would make somebody unclean. All right, let me read you a list of them. Childbirth is one of them. If somebody was, if they came down with leprosy, okay, the disease of leprosy, they would be considered unclean. Uh, if someone touched a corpse, if they had unusual bodily discharge, if they handled the ashes of a red heifer, if they came into contact with anything that was unclean, they themselves would be unclean. Um, so, it's not that that childbirth is just some some sexist thing that just just puts women down and makes them dirty. Okay, the ceremonial law, which you'll see if you read the book of Leviticus, it, it God has a certain way He wants to be whole, uh, worshipped, and the people who worship Him have to be holy, right? So you can't go touch a body, can't touch a dead body and be unclean and then go go sacrifice to God in the tabernacle. You just can't do that. So God has set laws here. She's unclean for seven days or she's unclean for 14 days, okay? These are laws that are for ceremonial worship of the Lord. Now, as for the sin offering, here are a couple other things that require a sin offering, okay? Unusual body bodily discharge. Again, a leper, someone who... who has leprosy you can't control if you have leprosy you can't it's not like you you willfully give yourself that or take it away um so it, it's clear here that again you have to read the book of leviticus to understand this sin offerings are not i mean j- just the word it seems like it's it, it's sinful right but a leper has not he's not sinning by having leprosy he's unclean so a sin offering purges uncleanness now sin offering does purge other things as well but in these specific cases, this is for ceremonial uncleanness. Okay. One more time. A leper, someone who has leprosy, it's not a sin for them to have a disease. All right, they can't help that. But they have to give a sin offering as well when they're cleansed. So same thing with, uh, with a child, childbirth. Uh, having, having sex is not a sin. Having a child is not a sin. What it does is it expiates... Or it cleanses their ceremonial uncleanness. That's all it does. And if you just read this without understanding it, it seems like, oh man, having a, a woman, I mean, having a child is, is a sin. That's that's crazy. That's crazy. But no, that's not the case at all. It's just, it, it just makes them clean uh, to be able to worship the Lord again in the tabernacle. And there's many, many other things that make people unclean too. It's not just childbirth. So it's not, it's not that women are being singled out here. That's right. A sin offering if a woman is suspected of cheating on her husband her husband can take her to the temple in order to drink some dusty water in a voodoo ceremony her tr- yeah this is this is a good one here so let's pull the text up um so numbers 5 11 through 31 he says if any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him and a man lie with her carnally and it be hit, <clears throat> excuse me, it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled. There be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. So she goes and commits adultery, but nobody, there's no, there's no witnesses to, to testify against her. It's secret, but the spirit of jealousy comes upon him. So, um, however this comes about, the Lord basically puts an Im- impression upon his spirit that, you know, my wife, for some reason, I think she cheated on me. Okay, this, I mean, if you're not, if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is not something you can understand, but uh, let's just say this, the spirit of jealousy come upon him. 
he be jealous of his wife and she be defiled? Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be not defiled? So then, yeah, what he calls this voodoo ceremony. Uh, let's listen. The trial is this. If she miscarries, she was obviously cheating on her husband and must suffer all consequences of the law for such adultery. Yeah, okay. And, and this he did not read this passage. I promise you he did not read this passage. Because nowhere in this entire passage does it talk about miscarriage, nor does it talk about having uh, any sort of child. All right, I think this is the last one, the last sentence. So to my understanding, actually, I learned this just recently, there is one Bible version that is that supports what he said, that talks about it being a miscarriage, and that's the NIV. Now I'll tell you, the people who translated that are wrong. All right, the text, if you actually look at the Hebrew, um, it does not indicate miscarriage whatsoever. So I will rescind what I said. If, if that's the version you read, uh, to look at this text, I will apologize and I'll say, okay, uh, you did read the passage. The only thing is you read a bad Bible. Um, so you look at any other translation, of course, I, I prefer the King James. Uh, you're not going to find any inkling of miscarriage. The only mention of a pregnancy is going to be at the end. It's going to be the blessing for her being uh, pure and, and a non-adulterer. So, yeah, if you, if you did use that version to make the video, I apologize. Uh, but that version is is very wrong. The only child that's mentioned is at the very end. Okay, the only child that's mentioned is at the very end. So, if if he has a spirit of jealousy and, and he accuses his wife of cheating, she drinks this water, holy water with dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. She drinks it and she takes an oath. Okay, if nobody's laid with you, you're gonna make this oath and you're gonna take this curse. So if nobody's laid with you, you're gonna be free from this curse. But if you have committed adultery and you are defiled and someone has lain with you, then the curse will go into your bowels. It'll make your belly to swell. It'll make your thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, amen. And of course, if she's guilty, that's going to happen to her. If she committed adultery, um, the curse will enter her. Her belly shall swell. Her thigh shall rot. But if she's not, if she's not guilty, if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. So, the only mention of a child in this is if she's actually not guilty um, and she's she's given a child after having to go through all this, um, this trouble. I mean, I can only imagine like if you are innocent and your husband accuses you of cheating on you, I mean, it's going to be emotionally um, draining. And of course, the Bible views children as a wonderful, wonderful gift, contrary to what, you know, the modern society today, they just kill babies, no problem, um, which is uh, God will judge heavily for that. But she's blessed with a child. So, yeah, this guy didn't read, he didn't read this passage talking about miscarriage. There's nowhere in this passage that talks about miscarriage. Death. But if she has a child, then she obviously wasn't lying. This was the test to see if she cheated. Yeah, so, again, if she wasn't lying, then she would, she would be blessed. She wouldn't, her, her, um... She wouldn't have the curse come upon her. Her her thigh would not rot, and her bowels would not uh, would not uh, the curse would not come into her, and her bowels or her belly would not swell, and her thigh would rot. So, yeah. So as the video wraps up, my attention is drawn to the comment section. I know folks are going to disagree with me, and that's fine. You can think however you want to. I express myself. Before you do comment, I'd like to point something out. A lot of Christians defend what is in the Bible because it's God's perfect word. If God says women are second-class citizens to be treated like property, who am I to say different? Yeah, and yet we made it to the end of the video, and he has not established this. His, uh, his premise, he has not established, nor has he been able to support it with any biblical text. The ones that he thought would surely, you know, plead his cause were out of context. They were uh, out of the cultural understanding of the time, and they were just wrong. They were just wrong. But he mentions the uh, urethro dilemma, Ur urethro, urethro, and whatever. That in itself is called the euthyphro dilemma, Thanks, and man. it's not really the focus of this video. Yeah, you throw. So this dilemma basically um, is raised by Plato, and it asks: Is something good because God commands it, or does God command it because it's good? And the answer is neither. Okay, for one. If something was good just because God commanded it, that would be arbitrary. God could one day feel one way and command this, and then another day feel another way, and then whatever he commanded, maybe one day he just commands you know Christians to just kill everybody, 
and we would have to do it because you know God told us to do it. That's not that's not the case. The second option uh, is is it is something uh, does God command it because it's good? That's not true either. Because if if God commands something because it's good, that means there is something outside of God that God is subject to. God God is commanding us to do something because it is good. That means God is not God because He is not the highest authority. He's commanding us uh, to do something that is outside of himself, that is that he's actually subject to. Because if God is subject to the thing he's commanding us to, which, which is good, then he's not God. Um, so basically, the simple answer to this is, everything God commands us in the Bible, it's not arbitrary, it's not because God is limited to something else. Everything God commands us in the Bible, is it shows us how to be more like God. God is good. Something's not good because God commands it, and God is not limited to an outside source uh, he does not command it because it is good. But what God commands, it shows us how to be like him. He himself is good. When God commands us not to murder, it's because God does not murder people. God does not commit adultery, so he commands us not to commit adultery. He does not lie. He does not steal. So when he commands us to do these things, he's revealing his nature to us. That's what the Bible is. It's God's revelation to mankind. He's revealing his nature to us, and he's telling us how to be more like him. So this, this dilemma is uh, it's not a dilemma at all. It's a false dichotomy. It's uh, easily solved. God is good. And when God commands something, he tells us how to be like him. That's what. That's why he commands things. That's that's how it works. That in itself is called the Euthyphro dilemma. And it's not really the focus of this video. The Euthyphro. Euthyphro. Okay. Euthyphro. Got it. second most common defense I see in the Bible's inherent sexism is that the Bible isn't sexist. God just made men to be a certain way to fill a certain role and women a certain way to fill. Yeah, he got it right. He got it right this time. A certain role. All the, all the text under the isn't sexist. Is wrong. God just made men to be a certain. The very image of God, honorable, lovable, respectable, strong, intelligent. Yeah, you know, in Genesis it said, "Let us make man in our image," and then He created man and woman. Uh, so women was created in God's image just as well as man was. Way to fill a certain role. And so women are uh, the very image of God. They're honorable. They're lovable. They're respectable. They're strong. They're intelligent. They are not life support for vagina for vagina. And women a certain way to fill a certain role. I want to tell everyone right here and now that if this is your defense for why you aren't sexist, you... Okay. The Bible isn't sexist, it just regulates men and women to their intended gender roles. Yeah, amen. If God created man to do a certain thing and God created women to do a certain thing, if we go without uh, without or outside of those roles, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be sinful, it's going to cause problems. Okay. Now, because you don't want to be under the authority of God, you want to do whatever you want to do, you can... You can uh, you could, what's the word I'm looking for? You could assign some arbitrary definition of sexism and apply it to this. You know, make up make up the own definition of whatever words you want, okay? But the Bible is unequivocally and uh, shown very clearly that God has created man and woman in his image that were equal. And that indeed, God created man for one purpose, God created a woman for uh, another purpose. And when men and women work together, it's a beautiful, blessed thing. <laughs> and if you don't like that, take that up with the Lord. But yeah, feel free if you'd like to define it to be sexist by your own definition. And for why you aren't sexist, you are sexist. Never mind that an invisible and silent ghost from the Stone Age is dictating your morale. Stone Age, huh? They actually had brass. You know, Tubal Cain was an artificer of brass, you know? And also invisible, yeah. I mean, if, if you would call upon the name of the living God, if you would seek him with all your heart, you would have a personal relationship with him. And you would see that, you know, we don't just think, we, we just don't have an imaginary friend. You know, I was an atheist one time too, for a long time. I didn't become a Christian until three years ago. Um, I used to think, I used to think people had imaginary friends. Anybody who believed in God, imaginary friend, they're an idiot, right? But see, if you would call upon the name of the Lord, you would see differently. For in mind that an invisible and silent ghost from the Stone Age is dictating your morality system for you, something that I could go on at length about. Oh yes, please go on at length about it. How you can have any say in morality um, when we're just a random collection of atoms. You can't objectively say that rape is wrong. You can't. You can't say objectively rape is wrong. If somebody wants wants to rape, what right do you have to say in this universe of random atoms when you know you die and then that's just it? In a million years have passed, no one's ever going to remember it. What right do you have to say that it's wrong? You don't. But since we appeal to an objective revelation from God who knows all things, who actually has the ability. Dictating your morality system for you. Yeah, hold on. Oh, man. 
Um, um, as I was saying, something in mind that an invisible and silent ghost from the Stone Age is dictating your morality system for you. Okay, yeah. So, a god who who knows all things, who 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 is good and who knows how to, um, basically, refro refro dilemma. Um, everything he commands is good because he commands to be like him. So he has every right in the world to something that in mind that an invisible and silent ghost from the Stone Age is dictating. Okay, dictate morality. Yeah, I mean he tells us how to be good because he himself is good. So yeah, everything he reveals is is just, it's holy, it's righteous, and I can appeal to that. I can tell, I can say objectively that rape is wrong, because God has revealed that uh, rape is outside of His nature. Okay, murder is outside of His nature, so on and so forth. But you, you as an atheist, you have no objective standpoint, no objective anything to stand on to tell me, to look at me and tell me that rape is wrong. You just can't say that. Your morality system for you, something that I could go on at length about. Therefore, if the source of your morals are sexist, so are you. The third defense I see is that this system in the Bible is leaps and bounds better for women than anything else of that time period. My response is, if your God is all... Yeah, by the way, it's leaps and bounds better for everybody throughout all time. Because God is timeless and his word is forever. And truth does not change. Truth does not change. If your morality system can change from today and tomorrow. That just proof that you do not have morality. It does not exist. Uh, all about being objective perfection, then comparing his moral code to the other moral codes of the day is extremely relativist. Even so, God didn't go far enough to help out women. The four. I would say he did. He he offered some very wonderful protections for. For women indeed and we did look at this defense I usually see are verses like this where we human beings are commanded to love our wives you'll notice that the Bible is written for men and not for women sure these verses do it Bible's written for men Bible's written for all people it's God's revelation of mankind exist but that doesn't make the Bible unsexist yeah so so every verse that Every verse that contradicts your position, where it actually tells us to love our wives and to love women, that that contradicts your position, somehow it it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, well. It just makes Christianity's followers loving sexists, as opposed to unloving sexists. Interesting logic there. There are also several verses about how to treat your farm animals well. That doesn't mean the Bible is putting animals on equal footing with men. The final defense I see is, you're taking these Bible verses out of context, or you don't know what you're talking about. I assure you I know what I'm talking about just fine. These well, my friends, maybe you could be the judge of how many verses he's taken out of context and how many verses and passages that he did not read that he wrongfully spoke about. Um, I think I'll be the first to say that you, my friend, you do not know what you're talking about. With, with I mean, with respect, I can tell that to you. I, I've offered you... I've offered you the proof of what the Bible actually says. So now you're, you're presented with an opportunity. You can, you can uh, take back these claims that you made. You can maybe make a new video and come up with better points or something like this. Um, but I do implore you to, to call out to the true and living God to repent of your sins and call on the Lord Jesus Christ because teachers are going to be judged more harshly. I read your comment section. If you are, I mean, you are leading astray people from the truth. And God is going to take that into consideration come Judgment Day. But you can be forgiven if you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask Him to forgive your sins, you, uh, you ask Him to save you. He will wipe away all your sins. Uh, he will save you. He'll give you a new heart. And then you can know uh, the true and living God. So yeah, with all due respect, my friend, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, you don't. Stories aren't that complicated, and the verses quite plainly speak for themselves. However, I've sourced all of the Bible verses I've used, and you can judge for yourself. And truth be told, I don't know what kind of special context they're using to read the Bible through to make what I've said invalid. I just read the words in the page. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Um, he, he offers an arbitrary challenge based on his own definition of sexism. 
Um, yeah, so I'm not even going to bother addressing this. But, yeah, I hope this was beneficial. Um, it's a shame that people watch this and they're, they're led astray by it, but we can see by just proper biblical exegesis or properly looking at the text and looking at the context surrounding it, even, even some definitions of words, um, we can see that God has made men and women to be equal. Um, the Bible is not sexist. And God, I mean, ultimately, he wants, he wants us all to be saved. Um, we live in a fallen world, um, and we all need a Savior. So, God bless you. Uh, in Jesus' name.